I'd like to call the uh, meeting of the City of Titusville Planning and Zoning Commission to order at this time. Uh, let's all stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, could we, uh, Secretary, have roll call? Vice Chairman Severs? Yes. Secretary Richardson? Yes. Member Spidell? Yes. Here. Member Bobbitt? Here. Member Taylor? Here. Member Idison? Here. Member Noel Copeland? Here. Well, certainly, based upon that, uh, we, do, we do have a quorum as such. Uh, I'd like to take up item 10D, the school board appointee, as uh, we understand it, Mr. Gibson Boyer has been appointed as the local uh, representative to the city of Titusville from the school board. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and then join us? Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Dave Lindeman. I'm with um, Brevard Public Schools. I'm the Director of Planning and Project Management. Um, as you're probably aware, we have a uh, school board has an interlocal agreement with the county and all the cities in Brevard so that they can appoint one member to each of the planning boards throughout the county and share information. So basically, we're asking Mr. Gibson Boyer, who we'd like to welcome the school board, appointed him unanimously at the last school board meeting to be the Titusville representative, and he's also a member of your community. Um, and basically, if you have any questions for the school board, you can ask Mr. Boyer to um, relay that to us. Uh, if you'd like to take your seat, I guess this would be a good time. Um, and at the same time, if we had any questions of the city of Titusville, we would ask Mr. Boyer to come to your board and relay that information. Uh, we also have a pretty good working relationship with Brad Parrish and planning staff here. And, uh, you know, we're, we're excited to have some representation and we want to make sure that schools are a major part in your community and that you know, we also help um, manage your growth and work with you on the, the right way for your community to develop. With that said, if there's any questions for me, um, I'd be happy to answer it. Otherwise, on, on behalf of the uh, commission, I want to thank you for your appearance, and we look forward to working with you. Uh, I think we all agree 100% that schools are very important, and. Uh, the scale or rating and and the like is very important to the city and to residents who live here as well as uh, those future residents who would like to locate here and we look forward to working with the school board great yeah this is a, good, a great relationship so we can make sure to plan where we need more schools or bigger schools or even downsize some schools um, as we've done. Yeah, well, we've done that a couple of times. Yeah. Fortunately, that's probably <laughs> yeah. good for good for now. We won't do that anymore. Then. Leave that one alone. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And, thank, uh, thank you for appearing. Thank you for welcoming okay. Mr. Gibson Boyer. Mr. Boyer, yes, sir. Is there anything you would like to say at this time? Uh, just thankful to be on the board, sir. I've lived in Bavard County my entire life, and uh, I'm very pleased to see that Titusville has kind of come back from. The, the space shuttle slump. So anything I can do to be a part of that, I'm more than happy. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome again. Uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Uh, we have minutes of January 22nd. Uh, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Not hearing any. Do we have a motion to approve? I move to uh, approve the minutes of the meeting of January 22nd. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? No? Okay. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the uh, traditional notice that's at the beginning of the meeting as far as how the public can participate in this matter. I envision changing them slightly because there's a duplication and the like and making sure they're consistent with our bylaws and with uh, what council has authorized as well. Uh, the first portion would be uh, simply indicating to the public that all persons who anticipate speaking on any public hearing item 
must fill out an oath card to be heard on the agenda item and sign the oath contained thereon. Uh, these cards are located on the table near the entrance uh, right here to the council chambers. Also may be obtained from the recording secretary. This meeting will be conducted in accordance with the procedures adopted in resolution 24-1997. Uh, those speaking in favor of a particular item will be heard first. Those opposed, second, and those who wish to make a public comment may also speak. Uh, an applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. That's particularly as it relates to quasi-judicial items. Uh, any person who speaks is considered a witness. If you have any photographs, sketches, or documents that you desire for the commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence will be retained by the city. And please submit such exhibits to our recording secretary. In addition, any person who desires to appeal any decision of the Planning and Zoning Commission with respect to any matter considered at this meeting will need a record of the proceeding and for such purposes may need to ensure that the verbatim record of the proceeding is made. Such record includes the testimony and evidence upon which the appeal is to be abased. In addition, the city desires to accommodate persons with disabilities accordingly in a physically handicapped person pursuant to Chapter 286, et cetera, Florida statute should give at least 48 hours notice prior to the meeting submitting a written request to the chairman of the meeting that the physically handicapped person desires to attend. Uh, Madam Recording Secretary, have we received any such requests? No, sir. Okay, thank you. And next I would like to uh, move on to item um, 9. Um, in accordance with uh, Chapter 31 of the Code of Ordinances, at the first meeting in February, we are to elect officers. I'm currently serving as vice chairman uh, as such, and um, we will be electing a new chairperson, a new vice chair, and secretary. I will first call open, are there any nominations to be made for chairman of the commission? Do I have any nominations? Uh, yes. Uh, Commissioner Richardson. Oh, you should have canceled that. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Bob. I would like to nominate uh, Vice Chairman Sievers to the new chairman position. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Second. Spidell. Second. Right. We're just taking nominations now. Okay. Any additional nominations? Uh, not hearing any additional nominations to we have a motion to, I guess, approve the uh, the nomination that's been made. Mr. Bobbick, would you want to make that? Yes, I'd like to make the motion for Vice Chairman Sievers, yeah, excuse me, Vice Chairman Sievers to become chairman. We have a second. Second. All those in play, favor, please say yes. Yes. Those opposed, no. Okay, the next office is the vice chair. Do we have nominations are open? Does anyone? Uh, want to be recognized for purposes. I cleared all, all the buttons. So any, um, anyone would like to be recognized to make a nomination? Yeah, you turned it off. Yeah, I, I did a good job. <laughs> Commissioner uh, Spidell. I nominate Mr. Richardson, sir. I decline. Ouch. Okay, do we have any other nominations? I'd like to nominate Commissioner Bobbitt. Okay, do we have any other nominations? Any other nominations? Not hearing any. Do we have a motion to to uh, appoint then the vice chair as such? I move that we approve Commissioner Bobbitt as vice chairman. Okay. Do we have a second to that motion? I second. Okay. Uh, and uh, a vote as far as all those in favor, please say yes. 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 Of the opposed, no. Okay. That passes. The last uh, position is secretary. Do we have any uh, nominations for secretary? I'd like to nominate Commissioner Spidell. Okay. Uh, any other nominations? Any other nominations? Not hearing any. Do we have a motion to approve Commissioner uh, Spidell as the, our secretary? 
I nominate Commissioner Spidell as Secretary of PNZ. Do we have a second to that? A second. Oh, Several seconds. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's uh, have a vote. Uh, all those in favor, please say yes. Yes. And those opposed, no. Okay. Thank you. We've conducted our business in accordance with Chapter 31 of the Code as such. The next uh, item, we have a series of uh, public hearings, and um, I would likewise like to read um, one additional statement. As I understand it, and after consultation with the uh, City Attorney's Office, there's only one item on the agenda that is a quasi-judicial proceeding, and that's item number 9D, the Canopy Living ALF. Uh, the others are legislative or uh, uh, decisions made by the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council. With regard to quasi-judicial proceedings uh, and the public hearings on all the items, I first would like to ask, have all items been properly advertised? Yes, sir. Okay. In addition, with regard to the one quasi-judicial item, has any member of the commission received any oral or written communication from any person, group, or entity with regard to that item? If you, no? No one has, okay. In addition, has anyone visited the site or made an investigation or inspection of the property as it relates to that particular item? Okay, thank you. In addition, uh, I will read the fo following additional uh, quasi-judicial procedures. It would say the following items, which is the one item, is subject to the quasi-judicial rule of procedure. Any wishing, person wishing to speak on any items must first sign a public hearing agenda card and sign the oath contained thereon. Those speaking in favor of a request will be heard first. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents that you desire for the Planning and Zoning Commission, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. Submit those exhibits to the recording secretary. Next, returning uh, to the agenda on item 10B, right away, number 1-2019, Greg Nelson. Staff, do you have a report and recommendation? Yes, sir. Um, uh, this is item uh, right of way one, 2019, found on page 17 of your uh, agenda packet. Um, the applicant is requesting to vacate portions of uh, platted rights of way and portions of the Titusville Heights existing plat. Um, the subject area is near the intersection of Interstate 95 and Garden Street. Uh, the subject rights of way do not meet the city's minimum street width standards and there are no immediate plans to improve them. The property is intended to be uh, recombined through the present request. Uh, since the recordation of the plat in 1924, several similar vacations have taken place for the establishment of uh, rights of way for State Road 406, which is Garden Street and Interstate 95. Um, City Council approved advisability per the allowances of Florida Statute 177.101, which is titled uh, Vacation and Annulment of Platts Subdividing Land. Uh, no objections were made to the vacation request by the local utility companies. Um, and staff is recommending conditional approval of the application subject to two conditions. And uh, I'd like to call your attention to a document in Agenda Star. There is a resolution in there with two exhibits. Uh, the first exhibit in the resolution shows the platted lots and rights of way as they currently exist. And the second exhibit would show how the, uh, what, what would remain. And uh, there are a few lots that are not uh, owned by the present uh, petitioner that would remain. And so a few of the um, rights of way in that plat would remain as well to um, ensure access to the remaining lots. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions uh, by the commission members of staff? Yes, sir. Just to add to the presentation, in, uh, Gabriel mentioned Agenda Star. So if you minimize your agenda, you'll see that 
icon on your desktop called Agenda Star. It's shaped like a star. And if you double click on that, open it up, you'll see an item or a PDF there called Resolution and Exhibits A and B. That's what Mr. Gabriel or Mr. Quintus was referring to. It is a replacement resolution, an updated one with exhibits to replace the one that was in the actual agenda item. So we apologize for not getting that to you in time for the agenda publication of this, but we had to make a correction to that resolution. You'll see two exhibits. One of them will illustrate what we hope will, which the applicant is intending that the final vacate of this plat will look like. Start. Okay. If you have any questions uh, as to where that's located, please tell us. We'll try and work help you. I found it, but <laughs> does the purple lots indicate those four lots not included? in this vacation or are they included in the vacation this will call it collaborate uh, the purple lines. lots are the lots left out okay of the request yes sir <coughs> any other questions of staff uh, Recording Secretary, do we have any cards on this item? No, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think uh, I see somebody here. Yeah, Rodney Honeycutt. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Honeycutt. Good evening. Uh, Rodney Honeycutt, 3700 South Washington Avenue in Titusville. Um, we're here tonight requesting vacation of those right of ways. Uh, as noted on your map, uh, it's all the areas that are in blue on the colored map if you have that. Um, on page 38, if I have the same page as you do, <laughs> there is Titusville Heights, the existing plat is there. Uh, it's very old plat. I think it was uh, 24, 1924. Um, those lots on there are 75 feet wide, and, uh, excuse me, 75 feet long and 25 feet wide. Uh, it's not buildable, really. Um, Mr. Nelson uh, owns, as you can see, the vast majority of all those lots um, that are left on the record that weren't vacated previously. Um, like I, I said, the blue areas are the areas that we're requesting to be vacated. Uh, the green areas are the areas of the right-of-way that are left in place. And the purple lots are the lots that Mr. Nelson doesn't own with the green uh, areas, which is the, the uh, platted uh, right-of-ways to remain, uh, will give access to those lots as they have now. Um, they, uh, the um, right-of-ways go north and they tie into an old Garden Street uh, right-of-way and, and this right-of-way by deed goes all the way to Singleton. Um, and so that's the access that these lots had previously and we're still leaving that. Um, uh, there's this plat goes all the way across Garden Street to the north. There's been at least three other vacations from this plat, and basically these are the lots that are remaining. Um, we received no objection from all the utility companies, even though that took a while a while to get because they didn't even hardly know where this area was. Um, we're requesting the P and Z board to approve our request for the vacation. Um, I would like to ask staff to help me understand the condition number one um, so that I can make sure that it's, it's agreeable. Um, the condition number one is, uh, states that all necessary deeds, easements, and variances are obtained to ensure that properties abutting the vacated portion of the rights of way have legal access to a public right of way. So what that's trying to state is that in the exhibit, uh, I think it was the second exhibit on that resolution that I asked you to look at, 
uh, you'll see the final outcome or what we, the applicant intends to be the final outcome. So the concern here is that there would be some remaining lots of the original plat that by law have to have legal access, even though there's you know, an actual approved road there, they have to have legal access by the definition. And so that green areas, as Mr. Hunnicutt's already mentioned, that's the out, basically. That's the legal access that those lots can, those remaining lots of that plat can have to a public right-of-way, even though it's not an approved right-of-way. So the final outcome of this vacating of a plat and the rights away with it and all the lots, that condition is to address any potential nuances. So let's say it doesn't come out to how exactly is illustrated here and there's something that needs to be adjusted. That condition will allow us to work with the applicant to try and make that adjustment. That's what it's really trying to get to so that we do not create a situation where we have one of these lots here that is uh, landlocked. In it. So, uh, certainly that is our intention also, um, but I don't know what I have to do other than to leave that right away and the second item says I have 180 days to do it. So that's why I was concerned. If there's anything we need to do, then we're willing to do it. If staff will, after if this is approved, then they'll say here's what you need to do, then we'll do it. But I just want to make sure that we're not agreeing to something we don't know, understand. So to answer Mr. Hennigat's question, that, um, that time frame will allow us, it kind of puts everybody on the gun to try and get this completed because let's say we, we vacate and then there's, a res there's an issue here that it just doesn't hang out there. So it has to be, it just gives a deadline basically. It gives, I think it gives enough deadline if we need to add more, that's something you could recommend um, to resolve it. Because otherwise then you would, if we are in a situation where we come, we have an outcome of this and it turns out that we might potentially have a landlocked uh, lot, which we don't believe will happen. We just need to make sure that that process, when it's outside of the city and goes through the, co the uh, county's process, that the outcome is indeed as illustrated. If it is not, then we, need, we have some time to resolve that with, with Mr. Honeycutt. Mr. Bobbick, do you have a question? All right, yes. Are you planning on building within the next 180 days, or are you going to be clearing? Or? No. Okay. So, yeah. That's it. I'm sorry, and to answer the other question, we are not asking Mr. Honeycutt to do anything in addition to this application. That condition doesn't require him to do So just if, if, there, if an issue arises, correct it within 180 days? Yeah, so that, that way it doesn't hang out there for several years. So mm -hmm. we're, we're adding a deadline, basically, to try and resolve this. Okay. But, but at this point in time, you're not aware of any issue that's outstanding that he has to address. Is that correct? correct? That's correct. I, I think Thank that was you. your concern. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Any, uh, other, any, any questions, questions yeah. uh, of uh, the applicant? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, my question is, this said it was going to be returned to acreage. How? What will the zoning be on this property <coughs> once it's returned to acreage? The, the zoning would re remain the same. There is no change to zoning or land use with this request. So the zoning will be what? Uh, I believe this, oh, I think it's CC right now. No. Is it OR and? The zoning on the property is currently general use, which is an agricultural or holding place kind of zoning category that we have. And also there are portions of the property that have open space and recreation or OR zoning. Those are not intended to change at all. That's not part of this request. And so those those four, five lots that are not part of this are also zoned in the same way? Uh, yeah, I see on, on the zoning map, which is on page 40 of your packet, uh -huh. you'll see that some of those lots are actually, um, some of them are inside that GU zoning, some of them are inside that OR zoning. So uh, They're in one or the other of those Correct. two? Correct, yeah. Okay. And what was the second condition? He had mentioned there were two conditions. You wanted, you were recommending it be approved with two conditions. I didn't A, a timeline, it. a deadline. Oh, That's that the was condition. the second yeah. condition? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, anyone else uh, on the public hearing? Any other cards? No, sir. Okay. Any further questions by uh, staff? Uh, to staff from uh, the commission? If not, I would entertain a motion on this item if you're ready to proceed. 
I'll yes, Mr. White. Uh, sorry. I'll uh, motion to approve. Subject to the conditions? Yes, sir. Okay. Second. We have a second? Second. Any further discussion on the motion? Uh, roll call, please. Secretary Spidell. Yes. Member Taylor. Yes. Member Addison. Yes. Member Richardson. Yes. Member Noel Copeland. Yes. Vice Chairman Bobbitt. Yes. Chairman Seavers. Yes. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is right away uh, number 3 2019 Hope Hammock. Staff, your, your report recommendation, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, this item begins on page 47 of your agenda packet. Um, and the applicant is requesting to vacate portions of platted alleyways to allow the placement of stormwater facilities um, associated within, or excuse me, with a multifamily development within those uh, rights of way. Um, the alleyways are perpendicular to South Brown Avenue, shown above here. And um, if the parcel surrounding the site uh, previously contained a multifamily housing complex that was condemned and demolished by the city in 2010. Uh, portions of the alleyways to be vacated to join other residential properties. During the site plan review process uh, for a proposed multifamily residential development, uh, the applicant determined that the proposed stormwater facility would require piping through one of the alleyways. Um, additionally, the applicant had requested and was approved for several variances, including uh, building setbacks and landscape buffers, and a condition of approval of those variances uh, required that the placement of any improvement within those alleyways would require a vacation of those. Um, and therefore, to move forward with the proposed project, the applicant desires to vacate the alleyways described in the sketch description. Uh, Florida City Gas and Florida Power and Light expressed no objection to the present request on the condition that an easement would be recorded over existing utilities located within the alleyways, uh, and no objections were made to the vacation request by any other utility. Staff is recommending conditional approval of the application subject to three conditions. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Bobby, do you have a question? Is this the same property that we were talking about a few months ago where they're going to do a development? I, I believe it's yours. It's not the same one? Okay. No. <laughs> Any other questions by other commissioners of staff? Uh, do we have any cards on this item? Yes, sir. Sid Chihayib. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening to you. My name is Sid Chehayib. I'm with Consulting Civil Engineers, 30, 3650 Bobby Lane. Um, and I'm here uh, representing the client uh, who is uh, basically, this is Hope Hammock. Uh, it's a project that we started about um, maybe um, nine months ago. And it's combining two lots next to each other. There's uh, one lot, and, and they are separated by a uh, uh, public right of way, which is 10 feet. It's uh, I think it was a recommendation too from from the uh, public works uh, director to uh, vacate uh, those right of ways because they don't want to maintain them. And um, basically, we would like uh, the commission to approve this unless uh, you have any any question. We agree with the staff uh, recommendation uh, and uh, conditions. Uh, there shouldn't be any issue with that, and that would help tremendously. This is a hope. It's called the Hope Hammock. It's uh, basically for uh, low income uh, housing, basically. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Do you have any problems with any of the conditions? No, sir. Any questions by the commissioners? Not seeing any. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Do we have any other person who want to be heard on this particular item? No, sir. Okay. I'll close the public hearing. i return it back to the commission. Any questions of staff? Any discussion? Someone like to make a motion? I move that we recommend approval of the right-of-way vacation 
number 3-2019 based on the three conditions from staff. We have a second. Second. We have a second. Any further discussion on the motion? Not hearing any, uh, roll call, please. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Addison? Yes. Secretary Spidell? Yes. Vice Chairman Bobbitt? Yes. Member Noel Copeland? Yes. Member Taylor? Yes. Chairman Sievers? Yes. Okay, that concludes uh, items uh, 9B and C. The next item is 9D. Uh, how many uh, cards do we have on this item? Eight. Eight cards. Uh, the council's uh, adopted policy here is to uh, uh, limit uh, time to three minutes. Uh, I hope people can keep it within that. As chairman, um, since this is a quasi-judicial matter, I feel as though people, as long as they're uh, giving uh, information that is helpful to the commission, that individuals should be given adequate time to present their case. So uh, uh, initially, I'm not going to uh, turn on the clock, so to speak. But uh, if I see we need to, uh, if there's any duplication, then we'll bring that to everybody's attention. We want to be fair to everyone. Staff, would you like to go ahead with your uh, report and recommendation? Yes, sir. Um, the applicant is requesting to amend the existing zoning designation of a 5.67 acre portion of a 9.11 acre parent tract uh, located along Cheney Highway uh, from community commercial to hospital medical. The uh, rezoning is requested to allow construction of a 50,000 square foot two-story assisted living facility, um, a maximum height of 35 feet is proposed for the development, excluding a 45-foot decorative uh, tower that is a component of the port cachet that's uh, proposed for this structure. A maximum of 75 living units uh, is proposed, uh, with a living area ranging between a minimum of 282 square feet for the smallest units to 495 square feet for the largest units and varying sizes of units in between. Uh, the Cathedral Pines subdivision is adjacent to the uh, subject property to the east and south. The Cathedral Pines Assembly of God Church campus lies to the west. North of the property lie the remaining 3.44 acres of the parent tract, uh, the State Road 50 right-of-way, and vacant commercial properties across the road. A conceptual plan submitted as an exhibit of this application depicts 50-foot vegetative buffers proposed along the residential properties adjoining the site, uh, preservation of all non-invasive trees measuring six inches diameter at breast height is proposed within the aforesaid buffers, a one point of ingress and egress is proposed along State Road 50 for access to the site, interior sidewalks would connect to the existing <laughs> sidewalk along the road. Building elevations submitted for the record de demonstrate the use of concrete board siding, uh, gabled roof lines, and craftsman-style architectural elements for building exteriors, and floor plans submitted by the applicant show compliance uh, with the minimum requirements of, uh, for common area and outdoor recreation area for ALFs. Contingent upon approval of the present request, the subject property is proposed to be split from the parent track to create a lot with a minimum of 100 feet along Cheney Highway, um, and, is, and Cheney Highway is classified an arterial roadway. The staff recommends conditional approval of this application subject to eight conditions. Pictured is the architectural rendering submitted. And this is a summary of the recommended conditions. The full text of those conditions are on page nine of the staff report. <coughs> I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Richardson, that old light or? Yeah, okay. that's not an old light, that's okay. current light. So in essence, 
the ALF we <coughs> will be on a flag lot. We would consider a flag lot more of a situation where it has a the minimum required uh, access. So that would be 25 feet. Since this um, fronts for 100 feet along the road, we wouldn't consider it a flag lot. It's simply a conforming <laughs> lot with a larger width towards the rear. <coughs> So they would be able to develop the lot in front of the ALF, right? They, well, I'm not, I don't believe that the current applicant proposes to develop or purchase that property. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Noel Scopeland. The, the lot that fronts to Cheney is not owned by the same people? Is that what you said? Currently, it is owned by uh, Southern Stallions, but I, I believe they have a, a, a approval or um, the purchase. The petitioner is uh, would purchase it uh, contingent upon approval of this request. The, so they're the not just developing half the lot. They're going to they their plan is to partition it into a separate piece of property, Correct. and someone else would own the front. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And is there a it, I read through these recommendations, I didn't see one about timing. Do they, if this is approved, they have to develop within a certain amount of time? I believe the current uh, time allowed is two years for, oh no, I'm sorry, this is not a CUP, so they would not have any time restriction on yeah. this. This is, this is a straightforward rezoning, so there would be no extension. This zoning would govern that property until okay. someone builds. Thank you. Any other questions by commissioners of staff? Okay, uh, the, uh, we first call upon the, the applicants uh, or representative of applicant uh, in favor of the request. Rodney Honeycutt, 3700 South Washington Avenue. Um, the request, as you know, is to rezone to hospital medical zone for 5.67 acres for an ALF with a maximum of 75 units. Um, we met with the neighbors uh, for the comp plan quite a while ago to discuss their uh, concerns. Um, we have agreed to leave a 50-foot buffer on the south and east side. Um, I, just to answer um, Ms. Copeland, I think's question, make sure she's clear. The uh, the area that's being rezoned would contain an ALF, and that's all. The balance of that property out front is still zoned community commercial, and <clears throat> and if the rezoning is approved, um, they will be two owners on the on the nine acres, one on the five point six seven for the ALF, and the balance will still be on to the current owner. Um, we agree to the conditions. Um, we submitted a site plan and we understand it needs to be substantially in accordance with that plan, which is number one. Um, I mentioned we agreed to the landscape buffers as the neighbors had requested. Um, and then staff has, has said that all site lighting shall consist solely of full cutoff at the property and we agree to that. Um, Staff also said a freestanding ground sign shall only be permitted as a monument sign. We understand and agree. Paved walking trails will be required as outdoor recreation. We agree. Um, the maximum, uh, I would ask you to look at page 94, which is the concept plan that was up before for the next one. Um, the maximum building height will be 35 feet, except if you look on page 35, which I have to find, excuse me, 94. If you look at the uh, portico where you drive under, just beyond it, there's a small area that's a tower. And that's, that's kind of uh, Canopy Living's standard detail. It's not very large and it's away from the property uh, and it will be no more than 45 feet in height. And the 35 feet in height is the um, height limit for general residential. Uh, the HM uh, zone, I don't know that it even has a height limit. Uh, so we're agreeing to 
add, to add this. We're agreeing that the only use on this on site that was rezoned would be an assisted living and that uh, we agree that we have to subdivide the nine acre parcel into two parcels before we start the site plan process. And so um, uh, it would be good next if the uh, developer would describe the facility and then uh, we can entertain any questions from you guys if you want to now. Okay, fine. Good evening, everybody. I'm Carrie Bailey, 343 Northwest Coal Terrace in Lake City. Um, I represent the Canopy Living, and so I want to make myself available to just answer any questions that you may have regarding the type of community this is. This will be a 64-unit assisted living community, and I know sometimes there's a little bit of question about what that means. We will not be a skilled nursing facility. We will not be providing... Um, hospice type care, nursing home type care, These will, this will be assistance with daily activities. So feeding, ba uh, eating, bathing, uh, uh, medications and so on and so forth. We will have a memory care component. So we'll be caring for those with dementia and Alzheimer's and so on. We'll have uh, group dining available. We'll have amenity spaces available, including outdoor <laughs> courtyard areas, um, secure in the case of those with memory loss. Um, we'll have available uh, transportation throughout the community and so on and so forth. So we'll have a pretty strong um, range of, of amenities and services that we'll be providing. And I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding the type of community and services that we'll be bringing. Okay, any member of the commission have uh, questions? I have a couple of questions. <laughs> sure. Uh, the canopy, what does that uh, represent? Why, why, why the canopy? That is a great. That is a great question. That's a. I'm. I'm happy that someone's <laughs> actually asked that. But when we were when we were talking about branding, you know, you sit around a table and you talk about what you want to represent and so on and so forth. Our first community is actually based in Lake City. And, and we were really drawn to, we've, that particular property has got a very large grandfather oak tree. And we like what it represents, strength, protection, stability, and so on and so forth. And so in, in, in reference to the canopy oaks, the large grandfather oaks, that's kind of the, 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 the sort of um, feeling that we were trying to convey with that branding. Are there any canopy oaks on this property? I do not believe so. Rodney can speak better to that. I haven't seen the tree survey yet. If they are, I sure hope we can keep them. Okay. The, uh, have you furnished a tree survey of the property to the, to the city? No, we have not at this point. Uh, if this is approved, then the next step, we have to do that. And, and this site is mostly pine trees. I don't, I don't know that there's any oaks. But we will have a tree survey. Uh, you represented there was 64 units. Staff represented there was 75 units. Which is it? The floor plan will have 64 units. Okay. So that's one of the that stipulations our, that you are agreeing to. Okay. That is a, yes, that is our prototype model, is 64 units. Okay. So... Can I butt in here? <laughs> I make sure. said something I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> no, no. There was, there's sometimes beds and units get confused. And I was under the impression that there are 64 units, but there's cases that maybe couples could be in one, and it could go up to 72 or 3, and so we just kept it at 75. But that's really beds not units, but I didn't want there to be any confusion. That's why we did well, that. Well, the staff report says 75 living units. I, I fully understand that in uh, assisted living facilities, many times there's two beds in a unit. So uh, not confusing to me okay. <laughs> at all. So if it's, if it's 64, it's 64. So just as a clarification, the 75 <laughs> units would be 75 beds. That's how you could equate it. Um, uh, so if there's two, if there are two beds within one unit or one space, um, well, my concern is the code 
talks about minimum living areas. If they don't talk about minimum beds, they talk about minimum living areas. So I would equate how many living units are there going to be in this facility. That, that's the way I see the code as being written. So, okay. Um, I think, Mr. Honeycutt, I had a question concerning the buffering on the south and the east, uh, which conversation indicated, and I'm looking at page 93 in our agenda packet, I, I, which says uh, on the easterly one, dry retention area and landscape buffer, a 50-foot buffer, uh, well, 50-foot parking setback, and then another portion of that 50 feet closer to the road says future parking within the 50 feet and dry retention area and landscape buffer. The way I look at the plan, it's certainly not going to be 50 feet of undisturbed vegetation within that 50 feet not based upon the plan is in our agenda packet, correct? So the 50 feet on the east side, Yes. Um, anything six inches or larger will be kept. And now how are you going to do that if you've got retention areas? Well, we won't, be able, we won't be able to have any, it'll be dry retention, there wouldn't be any retention in those areas where there are trees. Okay, I'm confused. If there's trees, which I understood there's trees throughout, how are you going to have room to have dry retention and not disturb the trees? Uh, there are some areas that there's not trees. If there are trees, there will not be any dry retention. It's six inches or larger. Okay. Well, I don't want any member of the public to be uh, misled or believe something and it's also a part of the conditions, and I'm frankly I was a little confused about the language of the condition, because either it's a 50-foot undisturbed buffer, which like it is on the south, or it's not. And as I read the site plan, which is kind of unusual as a part of rezoning, we're being asked, the Planning and Zoning Commission is being asked to approve the conceptual site plan. So I want to make sure as one commissioner, I know what I'm approving. So that's, that's why I'm asking the questions. So under the previous zoning for this property, the south uh, 50 feet was to remain undisturbed. The east 50 feet um, could include retention. And so we basically left that. I don't know that we'll need that, but we left it like that. Now, the parking is... No, we're not. That's well, not they're sure. clearly shown on the diagram. Yeah, I future, see that. Uh, future parking. The, the uh, sorry, the, the staff condition, the way it's written, would not allow any parking within right. those 50 foot buffers. And the staff condition, or the condition, would trump the, whatever's shown on this conceptual plan. Um, the detention areas. If there are any six inch uh, trees in there, those areas could not be disturbed. So th there's a potential that there could be no de uh, stormwater detention in that area if any six inch DBH trees would be removed or disturbed in any way. Well, if that's the case, then, then the condition should clearly state that and I do not believe it clearly states that. Um, we would agree to that, okay. to modify okay. that. All right, I just wanted to get that clarified. Okay, I understand. Uh, any other commissioner have a question of Mr. Honeycutt or? Yes, ma'am, you got additional comment? No. Okay. No. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have anyone else uh, wanting to speak in favor? <coughs> yes. Okay. Al Taylor. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Al Taylor, 2820 St. Charles Court. Uh, I do not abut this property, but I am in the same subdivision. Uh, I said I'm in favor of it. I think it's a great use for the property um, as far as density or what could be there if it was still under commercial use. 
Uh, I was on this board back in 97 when we zoned this to go commercial. So I remember some of the comments and everything. So uh, we like the idea of the 50 foot undisturbed. One of the questions I have though, uh, it was mentioned that this facility would have uh, people living there that would have dementia or memory problems. And what I don't see, and I, don't, I may be wrong, I just can't see it, there is no fence being placed along the southern and the eastern side. And I bring that up because when you look at just the other side of the property, which is Cathedral Pines Estates, we have retention. Back in, when these houses were built in the late 80s, swells or retention area was on the property owner's lots. So as you look all the way across the southern end and up one, two, three lots on the eastern side, there is a deep swell. So our concern, if there's no fence or no way that, especially since there's going to be walking paths in that area, that should a client or customer there get disoriented, and we've had a lot of rain. Now, lately it's been pretty dry, but I do remember several years ago when the hurricanes came through, we had water very deep in those ponds. And so I have a concern that that is not being protected for the clients or the customers that will be living at this facility. Now, there maybe there is supposed to be a fence there. I don't know. I don't see it on the plans. So um, this is only a conceptual plan. It would mm -hmm. not include all of the screening that's required. This would be a differing land use when compared to the single family. So screening would be required right. uh, along those. They could do vegetative uh, screening, uh, an uh, opaque vegetative screening uh, measuring six feet in height, or they could do a fence or a masonry wall. So at the I personally seat, would not like to see vegetative because vegetative does get holes. It can be penetrated. And I think as far as the safety of the residents that will be living there, it should be a solid type fence uh, to separate the two neighborhoods Plus, the neighbors that live there, if all of a sudden there's people, and it's right out their backyard, there's people in a walking path, it's right there at their back door. So, although I'm in favor of it, I would like to see, uh, to make sure that there is some kind of restriction for a solid structure to be put there. Um, I don't know whether that's just a wooden fence, a plastic fence, a concrete wall fence, what it needs to be, but there definitely needs to be some kind of separation and what I feel for protection of the customers that be living there. That's all I have to say. Okay. Mr. Question. All right. uh, this question might not be for you, sir, but uh, where is the walking path in this plan? The, the walking paths are not shown in this plan. That was an additional requirement that staff recommended. Um, okay. as part of the outdoor recreation area. Okay, so we're not going to be able to see where it would go or how it would route close to, like uh, this gentleman saying, by the by the back doors of other homes? So at the it, that would be shown at the site plan stage okay. if, if this is approved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next person. The next cards are neither for or against. So it's Tom. First drum. Tom Fernstrom, 4875 Winchester Drive. And y'all have to forgive me because Al might have said some of the same things I'm going to say. I have these hearing aids that are supposed to be high end, but it turns out they're low end at the high end price. <laughs> So, um, some of the residents, I'm the uh, president of the Homeowners Association over there, and some of the folks came to me with the concerns about how it's going to affect their property values, how it's going to affect their quality of life. And looking at the existing buffer, it doesn't look like it does a whole lot for sound and visual. So... I suggested, and maybe someone else has already suggested it, an eight-foot wall along the property line of those houses on St. Mark's 
and in Winchester that are affected by this. It gives them a little more privacy and may slow down people coming into their backyards. And the reason I say block is because it'll be there a lot longer than any other kind of structure you put up there. So, and I say eight foot because you're talking about commercial property bordering residential. And I'm not sure what the city's code is. I know residential is six foot. In a lot of places, commercial bordering residential is eight foot. So that's something you all can iron out if that's the route you choose to take. So, and also, if the border of the wall is along their property lines, the residential property lines, you still have the buffer on the side of the commercial establishment that they could possibly utilize. They're talking about walking trails. It could probably be used for that, so it could have a win-win for the residents and the facility. So that, that's all I have. If okay. anybody's got any questions, I mean, the questions is gentlemen. Yes, Mr. Bach. So, have the the residents of Cathedral Pine said that they're okay with having an eight-foot wall in their backyard? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Me, personally, if it was mine, I would want that. Okay. Similar to what they have between Walmart and the other houses along Cathedral Way. It just, it, it seems like, you know, from right now, from what I see, they just have woods, which oh, is... I, I can't hear you. From right now, from what I've seen on it, they just have woods in their backyard right yes, now, there correct? Is. Yes, there's vegetation. But as far as, especially along St. Mark's, <clears throat> especially along there, the visual and the noise aspect this would make it worse instead of better if you didn't put something like that there. Okay. I'm just wondering, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, live alongside the interstate. And, uh, you know, the state has put up these big walls. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't like that as a view of their backyard. Yeah. So maybe as, as opposed to like an eight-foot block wall, there might be a, a more aesthetically pleasing uh, alternative there that we could look at. Yes. Well, that was just a suggestion to these residents by me and, you know, they can, they can speak better about it than I can. I'm just speaking from my own personal and what I've observed there. Okay. So. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next. Woody Bramblett. Uh, Woody Bramlett. I've lived here for 30 years. Uh, I'm on the south side. <clears throat> I've been in that same location for 30 years, so I'm about in the middle of the property on the south side. I was here when they rezoned it before. Uh, <clears throat> and you've answered some of my questions already on the buffer. I was concerned about the, the east side buffer with how you're going to do buffer with the trees and so forth, and the walking trail and the parking. So you've answered some of those questions. I will say that we, we, some of us have kids, I've got grandkids now, that play in the backyard, and it would be helpful to have some kind of barrier, not just the trees and things, to, to stop the kids from being able to go over into that area and also residents from coming into our, our area when we got kids in the backyard. So we normally don't let them play in the front yard because of the road, so we let them play in the backyard and now there's going to be something there. So just take that in consideration. I do appreciate the builder, the uh, developer and the engineer. We met with them some time ago, and they have incorporated quite a few of our recommendations. So I do appreciate that. Uh, one thing we was concerned about is the drainage away from our property on how, how it's developed. The east side is kind of lower than the, the middle or the... Uh, the west side, so that whole property would have to be re-looked uh, at the elevations to get the drainage correct. And I didn't see anything, in, you know, I didn't see anything in the, the information that we had to look at to see how the elevations were going to be. But that's a consideration to look at is the elevations. Uh, and the barrier also gives you 
the opportunity to put that walking trail in because that was our concern. If you have no barrier there and you have the walking trail, and I can understand having a walking trail. My mom was in assisted living for years, and it's good to have an exercise area for those people. But they did have a fence around her particular area that so they couldn't contain them. So they could contain them. So, uh, so that's all I've got. I don't want to step on somebody else's areas. That's all I've got to go over, but I just want to have the staff consider those. Thank you. The sir. elevation. Thank Any you. questions? All right, next card. Janet Tuttle. Hi, I'm Janet Tuttle. I live on St. Mark's in the southern southeastern corner of this portion of property. Um, my concerns were the same thing, um, fencing or even the barriers, because we, we also will have the traffic of the garbage dumpster right in on my southeastern corner of that property. Um, also, the deliveries are on that back southern area also, so we're concerned about our property values. You know, maybe that'll be a deterrent from resale later. But I'll also, but it's mostly the safety too. We like the barrier because that retention area, I have lived on this property since 1990. It has remained underwater for like months at a time. So it's not very pleasant after a couple days. There's all kinds of debris maybe that's floating around in it. And it's just, we're just kind of really concerned about the safety also of the residents and our properties and our children and grandchildren, but I would like to be considered also for the property for the barrier. And if there's not a fencing, you know, what's the rules for, is there fencing around the delivery areas or just the garbage area? So we'd like to continue further on the other issues that come up later with this too. Thank you. Uh, I think we had a question. Yes, Joe? Well, I agree with you about uh, the dumpster being objectionable where they've got it located and the deliveries because that's the closest point for emergency vehicles, ambulances and things like that. So the deliveries <laughs> and the dumpster I find objectionable. They have to redesign that before I vote for it. Okay, next card. Timothy Unruh. I'm Timothy Unruh at 4820 Winchester Drive. I'm on the eastern side um, near the bottom. And um, you echoed most of the concerns I had as far as the description of the eastern side's drive retention, whether you know they would be leaving the trees because as our backyard is mostly dry retention, it is quite lower than that other property. So we just wanted to verify that they wouldn't be, you know, lowering that as well. We already face issues with the drainage. We were told it was supposed to drain within 72 hours. Last year, the water stayed for three months, but that's a separate issue. Um, so that we just want to, you know, get some clarification on what that area, the buffer area will entail. Uh, additionally, like with the parking, if that's actually a possibility that could be coming to that area. Um, Let's see. I do echo your thoughts on having an eight-foot wall uh, right on my property line. Not too thrilled of that idea. Obviously, I knew going to this, that's not my property, so they're free to do with it what they will. But we did enjoy having that tree line, obviously. So maybe naive of the processes and the rules can be set, but if there's a possibility of that wall being offset a certain amount to allow some natural view, that would be agreeable. Obviously, we don't want them to lose out on some of their property, and we understand that a walking area would be beneficial. We just want to make sure that you know we both maintain property value, and they get to maintain having a walking trail where the residents don't end up, you know, swimming in our uh, retention area. Um, beyond that, I think my fellow neighbors have pretty much echoed all of my concerns. So, thank you. And Eric. Any other cards? Yes. Okay. Mary Spar. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Mary Spar, 
825 Clifton's Cove Court in Cocoa. A group of citizens called the Tree Team is working to reduce the clear cutting of trees in Titusville. And we've been looking at the Titusville tree regulations. We found out that for a rezoning, Section 5.2.8.7 of the Development Review Procedures Technical Manual says, this is for a rezoning, the applicant has to submit general information ab about proposed landscape areas including existing trees and tree clusters. All I'm seeing is the aerial in the St. John's River Water Management District Florida Land Use Cover Classification Systems uh, Upland Forests <coughs> map. Now you are considering rezoning and do you have this information on proposed landscape areas including existing trees and tree clusters? Or am I to assume that there will be no existing trees saved outside of the 50-foot buffers? A concept plan is included with the rezoning paperwork. I believe um, Mr. Honeycutt referred to page 95. Um, the same tech manual in sections 14.3.2 and 14.3.3 says the applicant should include as part of his concept plan location of wetlands, major trees, or major groups of trees, topography, and open space. Has all that information been supplied? Your agenda packet indicates that jurisdictional wetlands may, may be present. So that information is obviously not available. I think P and Z should be supplied with the information that the Development Review Procedures Technical Manual says is required so that you can do your job properly. The concept plan drawing states in the portion showing the 50-foot buffer on the south and east, dry retention allowed. And such wording seems to imply that dry retention is okay in the complete buffer, though condition two recommended by staff states, stormwater detention areas and walking trails permitted are permitted only within the area of the buffer exceeding the minimum requirements of the land development regulations. And I gotta say, I had a little trouble with that table, but I believe that it, only a 10 foot um, buffer is required between uh, commercial, which is, is considered, and uh, uh, the residential um, subdivision. Um, so, um, anyway, I'm not seeing um, that buffer divided. Um, in stormwater detention areas and walking trails, oh wait, I, I, I just said that. Okay, will these drawings be modified before council approval to show the separation between the dry detention areas and the required buffer? and also to show the walking trails, which obviously should not be placed in stormwater detention facilities. You would think that all the field elevated areas and all the impervious areas will result in a lot of stormwater runoff that flows into the dry detention areas. How is that going to affect the neighboring residents? Now, as discussed earlier, the applicant proposes that in the 50-foot buffer, they will preserve all non-invasive trees measuring six-inch diameter at breast height. These trees may not be the type that can withstand frequent water inundation of their roots. Um, and I feel we need a lot more clarity in the drawing. Um, 
to show exactly what areas should be the dry detention stormwater ponds and which areas should not. Um, it, it really is an issue. I know I live where there's a lot of, there's quite a few, well, there's swales on both sides of, of um, our street. And the, the trees, the only trees planted in these swales, which would be like a dry detention, are cypress trees. And they do well, but I don't think anything else would do very well. Okay, so um, finally, I, uh, I was wondering if it is remotely possible that the property owner could consider to retain the approximately three and a half acre portion of the property to the north. It seems like instead of cramming their building and their large storm water pond resembling a DOT pond into the reduced portion of the parcel, they could have a much more appealing and attractive project by placing their assisted living facility on the entire 9.11 uh, acre parcel so that the residents could truly experience canopy living. <coughs> Commissioner, any questions? Okay. Any additional cards? No, sir. Okay. Uh, under quasi-judicial procedures, uh, Mr. Honeycutt, do you have an opportunity for rebuttal, if you'd like. Sure. Just a couple of points that I would like to clarify. I know there's been some concern, particularly about the memory, the memory impaired folks, possibly kind of roaming about the property and, and the damage that they could do to themselves. Um, just to be very clear, there are a lot of actually state required restrictions on folks who are memory impaired. They're required to be in a very secure location. So I don't believe the site plan actually shows this, but the, but the outdoor space that is specifically for the memory impaired residents is contained within the building. So they are in a secured fence location. Actually, all courtyards attached to the building are will be fenced. But I just want to be very clear to anybody who does have concern with the memory impaired residents that there are very secure procedures to make sure that those folks are not wandering about the property because that's not good for that's not good for the residents. It's not good for anybody. So I just want to be very clear on that. And then just to be clear also on traffic, truck traffic coming in and out. I know there's some concern about dumpsters, about food deliveries. We're generally, with this type of a community, you're going to see maybe once or twice a week trash pickup, and you're going to see food deliveries once or twice a week. It's a pretty low impact community. So I know that it's very easy for me to stand up here and say that, but I do want to just also address that concern that this is not quite the same as putting in a grocery store, a restaurant, gas station, et cetera. It's low traffic. You have not very many vehicles coming in and out, and you really don't have a lot of truck traffic coming in and out. So I just wanted to point that out. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, if uh, there's no other cards, uh, we will close the public hearing, return it back to the commission. Any members of the commission have any questions, comments at this stage? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Bobby. So uh, I'm hearing a lot about the barrier. And, you know, I understand that, you know, obviously security is something that, that you definitely want to take in mind, especially for uh, people with memory issues. It's for some reason, they're always drawn to water. Um, I, I go back to what I said earlier about having a barrier in your backyard. Um, I'm wondering if the plan would allow for the barrier to be on the inner side of that 50-foot buffer. 
so that way the residents of uh, the neighboring areas would not see a wall, but they continue to have their tree line. But the, the safety protocols of having a barrier or even a sound buffer uh, would still exist. Um, is that something that would be an option? So you understand what I'm saying, though, to where it would be, you know, you've, you've got the edge of your parking lot and then you've got your 50 foot buffer. Just put that wall at the edge of the parking lot instead of on the other side of that that barrier. That way it, it you know, preserves a natural look to all the residents and also, you know, um, eases any concerns that they might have about a wandering patient or anything and sound issues as well. I would I would like to interrupt before the applicant comes back up just to talk about property exactions and to remind the Planning and Zoning Commission that if any condition is going to be placed on a rezoning, there needs to be a basis in the code or a reason that you would have for that particular condition or um, something that would reduce the property owner's ability to develop or use that piece of property. Okay. So at that time, I guess I withdraw that question. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Richardson. Uh, from this concept plan, uh, all the services that make a lot of noise and are uh, objectionable services are clearly the closest to the lots on St. Mark's Drive. So there's a lot of redesign that could go into putting the uh, gazebo and things like that where those are located now and I see uh, where the garbage truck would have to back down that road or come in uh, back of those houses to uh, turn around so you know as it as it's presented I have difficulty with this conceptual plan Uh, Commissioner Spardell. Um, like Mr. Bobbitt, I was concerned about you have a lot of neighbors here that would like a solid barrier, whereas environmental studies say that we don't want to cut down those trees, that your, your noise uh, reduction is increased with vegetation also. And this is a question to staff on the recommendation for landscape. What I hate to see is any sizable trees replaced by small bushes. But I also know from the attorney that we have to go according to what's on the record right now. So um, with, are you referring to mainly in those setbacks or the buffers or anywhere there's on the a side. recommendation that says um you know you can't cut the six inches or something what my concern is is and, and then also just to be reminded that what is current right yes ma'am any you're existing not, you're not cutting down large trees you're not cutting down much vegetation but you've got neighbors here who are, are very concerned about a physical concrete wall yes ma'am <laughs> I'm trying to sell some trees here so, and less carbon footprint. Right. So the the way the condition is written right now, if if there were a requirement for a masonry wall like that, the two conditions might conflict because if you have to remove trees, then and that condition would have to be amended. Um, so. I... I can't see that a resident would want a large concrete wall in their backyard. I, I is that what we're talking about, Ms. Bobbitt? I correct. Um, but then we have three people who say that's what they want, and you're living there. Okay. Anything else? I guess that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I ask legal for advisement on how I could properly rephrase that question earlier? Before I 
answer that, I'd like to read the statute that I was referring to, 70.45 on governmental exactions, which defines a prohibited exaction to mean any condition that is imposed by a governmental entity on a property owner's proposed use of real property that lacks an essential nexus to a legitimate public purpose and is not roughly proportionate to the impacts of the proposed use that the governmental entity seeks to avoid, minimize, or mitigate. So any condition would, you'd have to demonstrate has an essential nexus to the thing that you're trying to protect. Um, so the, the thing about the wall is that it's because of the interface with the adjoining property. And so that would be the nexus there. And the applicant, of course, would have to agree to it. The placement of the wall would take away the use of a large portion of the property that I don't know that is directly proportionate. But that's a test that the governmental entity makes. And so I'm on the fly here giving you a little bit of that analysis. But, and that would be talking about moving that wall further inward. And I think we've had previous applications that have talked about this concept and, and having a condition that a wall be put somewhere other than the borderline is something that the city attorney and I would recommend against because we do not feel that that would be we feel that that would be a governmental exaction that doesn't have a pro a, an appropriate nexus to the action being proposed. So as far as having a border wall that you're talking about that would probably have that nexus, I don't know if that's something that the community is looking for. I don't know that I've answered your question, but trying to analyze the scenario with the solution you're trying to achieve Trying to give you some guidance on how you can get there. I'm just trying to think of a, a way because I'm, I'm hearing the concerns of the, the citizens that are going to be, you know, looking at this wall every day. Obviously, there's a want uh, or, you know, some type of ease of concern is needed uh, for wandering patients, which I know you've addressed uh, already. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to inhibit the developer from creating, you know, this. But at the same time, just I would hate to have a wall in my backyard. So I'm just thinking for them, uh, if there was anything that we could do as a compromise without infringing on the developer's actions or plans or anything else like that, if, if they voluntarily look at doing something like that. Uh, Commissioner, I, I would, I won't, I won't recommend it, but I, I, I'll say that uh, uh, screening is required already. So instead of, Perhaps instead of giving them the option of vegetative screening, you could recommend uh, a fence uh, to satisfy that requirement of screening, which would be a six-foot fence. Okay. Okay. Is it okay to ask for the citizens to voice their opinion on that, or it's we've already closed it out? <laughs> Okay. Well, well, I know a lot of them were talking about block wall, but maybe a fence would be a, Might be a compromise. more aesthetically pleasing option. I'm seeing head and shakes. And again, the, the community will, this is a recommendation that's going to go to council before any final action is made. And so at that time, the council will probably have further deliberation over what the actual conditions may be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, C Commissioner Spidell, you're next. Yeah, I, I, Okay. Commissioner Richardson. A vegetative uh, or just a fence, I wouldn't object to, but removing those services that I find so objectionable, including the dumpster, deliveries, and the generator, and the maintenance building would have to be located somewhere else. Commissioner Noel Copeland. So what are our options here? If we, we have some people that are clearly, they, they're, they don't like this, do we have an option to have another version come back for a conversation with potentially the removal of services, potentially the tree survey, potentially where these walking paths will exist? Like, it sounds like a lot of people are saying we don't have enough information 
to make a recommendation. So do we have an option to say table to come back? Certainly that is an option because uh, the public hearing before council is March the 10th and we will have another meeting prior to that. Okay. I just want to understand kind of what our options are. Not a flat denial, but like we feel like we need more information. Okay, I, I have uh, a number of comments as well. I, I met with staff uh, yesterday and have reviewed the matter further today. And as I told staff, I was really struggling with this one uh, for, for a number of reasons. The, the first and the primary fundamental reason is HM. There is not <laughs> HM in any area south of Garden Street. HM is a designated area primarily in the northerly end of the, the city, and HM says the hospital medical district is created to provide a protective area for the harmonious development of health care facilities and accessory services convenient to arterial streets and is to be protected from encroachment by other land uses. So, for, for whatever reason, uh, I'm, you know, let, let me just make clear that uh, assisted living facilities are allowed in a number of districts. Uh, HM theoretically is listed as one of those, but fundamentally, uh, I have a problem with HM being <laughs> uh, the uh, zoning category, and I realize that complicates things for the applicant because if they went with R2, R3, they'd have to go through a land use change. It would be a small scale. It wouldn't be a large involvement. But um, the whole, I view, assisted living facilities as compatible with residential areas and the buildings or structures are to be compatible, for example, Sandpoint or whatever the one on Harrison Street is that we all have known that's been here a long time with individual um, three or four or five, six units together uh, as an assisted living facility. When I look at this plan that looks like a nursing home facility with a big box and you start at one end of the property except for the 50 feet and bulldoze everything down and the entrance way and the whole, that's the way the site plan is laid out without any regard to the layout of the, the property. And the other major concern I have, fellow commissioners, is that uh, the, this, uh, for whether it's HM or whether it's R2, R3, uh, the use is allowed, it's a limited use. It's permitted as long as you meet the conditions there are nine conditions listed in the code which enumerate the things that uh, must meet, and we do not have information to show whether or not they meet those conditions or not. You brought up about uh, the recreational facilities, the trails, uh, the common areas inside. We have no information, and you're asking the Planning and Zoning Commission to make a recommendation approving a site plan when we have no information to show that it meets those. Uh, for, for example, and which I think further illustrates the question I have in my mind about HM, it's for assisted living facility, all structures shall be residential in character, street orientated with pedestrian entrances compatible with surrounding residential development. Then it says, interesting, properties within HM are exempt from this requirement. <laughs> that suggests to me that this area shouldn't be HM because this is being compatible with the surrounding residential area, <coughs> which it's supposed to be. And uh, I, I just uh, also, I mean, then it goes on and talks about the common space per bed. It talks about 
uh, outdoor <coughs> recreation. We have no information showing compliance or non-compliance with those uh, requirements. I know staff report says it complies, but we don't have a clue in examining the uh, plan. And as one other individual did indicate to you, I mean, I did go back and look on rezoning and text amendment. Uh, in order to illustrate the proposed use, you can consent, submit a conceptual site plan, and it clearly says if you're going to do that, you have to show the proposed landscape areas, including existing trees and tree clusters. I don't see that information in here whatsoever in the application, or at least what's been submitted to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And I think it should be submitted and a part of uh, the materials we receive. Um, I would respectfully suggest that I, I'm, unless you look these nine items up, you wouldn't know what limitations there are and whether or not they're in there because they're not enumerated uh, and uh, by the applicant showing where they have complied with these nine items. Uh, so I have a problem with proceeding for uh, those reasons. Uh, in addition, uh, I do think minimally they ought to have some tree information. As the code says, they're supposed to have. And, um, I mean, I have other concerns about the, uh, but fundamentally, I think we should table the item and uh, ask that uh, additional information be provided so that we can see whether or not they meet the requirements of the code. And um, I don't think we have that information today. Yes. Commissioner Smidell. I, I move to table this item and to provide to the commission um, a minimum of the items that uh, Chairman Seeger asked for. Second. Is there a second? I did. Okay, any discussion on the motion to table? Can, can we just clarify exactly what we're requesting them to come back for or come back with. I, I know there was a, a pretty decent list there. Yeah, that pretty decent list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I can ten, about ten points, right? I mean, I, I'd be glad. I, I, I wrote them out. But those are essential points. <laughs> if you want to see them. Yeah. But uh, I, the first question dealt with uh, to ask the applicant and staff to uh, provide. Uh, additional information as to the appropriateness of HM in this uh, in this location, whether HM is the appropriate zoning district in this location. So, uh, I'm sorry, to, to just clarify, what you're asking for staff or the applicant Both. to provide? Both. Okay. What, what and, exactly? And in the meantime, if any of the commissioners have a question, they should feel free to come to you and ask Certainly. you. Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> And just to clarify, the HM zoning district, um, the, one of the conditions that staff proposed would disallow every single use in HM other than an ALF and uh, an assist, or a convalescent home. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, the second one I'd listen, and I talk more about that, to prevent staff and applicant additional time to address sections 28-72C4 in each of the criteria to determine and show compliance with those requirements. Those we can uh, we can certainly give you those uh, preliminary building plans. Uh, staff has reviewed every single one of those building plans, but um, normally this is not the stage at which we would review building plans. It's normally at the site plan stage and at the building permit stage. So I, I agree with you. Normally we would not. However. <coughs> We're being asked to approve something, a site plan, without knowing whether or not it meets these nine items in, in the code, and we're, we're not supposed to have an ALF there unless they meet those requirements. And we're asked to make a recommendation on it. That's my concern. 
Uh, the, the third one was about the uh, tree survey, or if not a tree survey, certainly uh, locating the um, major trees and tree clusters to see how this layout is in relationship to the code provision that someone is supposed to design around and preserve trees. We don't know whether there's a problem or not. And you're asking us to prove a uh, site plan. Just as a point of clarification, this is not a approval of a site plan. This is just a conceptual plan. A conceptual plan. plan. Excuse me. Wrong okay. word. <laughs> I understand. Th those were the major items. So we had a motion. We had a second. There's further discussion on the item. Yes. So we've heard your concerns, including from the public. Just wanted to clarify or give you some information about how we reviewed this. When we met with the applicant, the first request was to straightforward just rezoning of this property to hospital medical. And as Mr. Chairman has already mentioned, that is primarily located in the north part of the city. So we struggled with this as to allow that particular zoning district in this area, especially next to uh, existing single family subdivisions, including all the uses that are listed in that zoning district, including um, a hospital. So we, we asked the applicant to consider the option that's available in the code to submit maybe a concept to allow us to work with them with some conditions to restrict this, to kind of mitigate some of the impacts of that particular zoning district and see if that would be acceptable by the commission and by the city council. So we worked with them and Gabriel uh, worked with them in many, many meetings and coming up with some tailor-made um, conditions, including as, as Gabriel has already mentioned, limiting the uses specifically to just one particular use. So all the other uses that are, are typically allowed in that zoning district, hospital, medical, are excluded. They're not permitted. So this is a tailor-made zoning basically for this property. The concept plan is, is that's just it. It's a concept. You're not approving a site plan. We would be able to bring an engineer drawing to you. I mean, I don't think an applicant would spend that kind of money to be able to bring that kind of, those kind of plans to you for review. So there is an administrative process for that. If you believe that there are some conditions that we're missing here to kind of mitigate the potential impact of the use that's being proposed here for this property, we, I think you can propose those as was already discussed as far as maybe some kind of solid or opaque screening of a wall or, or fence or something like that. I think that's appropriate. You could probably propose something like that. Where that's located, we can, I think, I think you could allow the applicant some flexibility as to where that is. Voice already heard the applicant mention that they would agree to some kind of fence there as well. Um, that said, if you, I, I wouldn't be hung up too much on the concept plan. Um, we propose conditions in there to try and separate that use. And again, this is one particular use from the remote surrounding uses as much as possible. You could also propose a condition to reorient the services or other particular types of services that happen as associated or ancillary to that particular use to somewhere else in that property so they're further separated from the single family. That's something you could, you have every right to suggest as well. But I, I would just be caution you to ask for specific details that are typically handled at a site plan stage. I also want to mention about the fact that there, there is in the concept plan list of items that either you go through this route, that this is something you're supposed to submit as far as the location of trees. No, that was not submitted at this time. You could certainly ask for that. I think if the applicant wants or is able to provide something like that, um, but I don't think it's going to be the level of detail that you would typically see at a site plan. It will probably give you some general ideas as to where large trees are probably clustered. I think that's probably what, something you could probably accept or see at, that, at this stage, especially the time frame from this meeting being tabled or this agenda item being tabled to the next meeting. I think that's probably reasonable. And I'd ask the commission, if, if, ask the applicant if that would be acceptable. Um, because I think what we just maybe be cautious about asking the applicant for too much information that are site plan related, especially the time frame that you have by at your next meeting and for you to make a decision. So I just want to bring that out to you. I'll try and answer any questions you have about this. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Not necessarily speaking for uh, Commissioner Noel Copeland, but I think she would like to see, for example, examples of where the trails are, where, where they would be, not engineered 
drawings or anything like that, but uh, a, a concept. And that's not in any of this information. I'm just using that as one example that certainly she brought up. Okay. Uh, Mr. Buck. So just speaking on the TEC side of it, um, I understand that the site plan and the process of how it goes. Um, I know the TEC would be concerned about the tree survey and everything before it goes too far, but stuff like that would be reviewed before anything else would be approved to move forward, correct? Yes, sir. A okay. site plan, that is. Okay. That they have to submit a mitigation plan with a tree survey showing all trees six inches TBH or greater. Okay. Um, and a note on the conceptual plan, um, the areas that are blank on that conceptual plan do not necessarily indicate clear cutting. Um, just wanted to clarify that, that this is only a concept we, at this stage, the code does not allow or does not give staff the ability to require um, a very detailed tree survey. Okay. okay, anything else on this particular item? If I may, um, I understand Mr. Parrish's concerns on that. We are giving a lot or putting a lot on the developer's plate for two weeks from now. So maybe it's something for us to reconsider. I know we had a motion in a second, but maybe if we withdrew that motion, discuss a little bit further on how we can move this forward in a way that benefited the community, benefited the developer, and, and didn't gum us up along the way. So I'll leave that to the rest of the, my fellow commissioners to decide. Do we hear uh, any withdrawal of the motion or the second? Uh, we'll call for uh, a roll call vote. Secretary Spidell? Yes. Member Taylor? Yes. Member Iderson? Yes. Vice Chairman Bobbitt? No. Member Noel Copeland? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Chairman Seifers? Yes. Okay, next item is uh, Uptown Height uh, LDR. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, the item is a proposed text amendment to allow multifamily structures west of US Highway 1 uh, to have a maximum height of 10 stories um, with a recommendation of the Com Community Redevelopment Agency. Uh, multifamily structures on properties abutting single-family residential uses would be limited to a maximum of five stories. Uh, the CRA recommended approval of the ordinance with two revisions. Uh, one was eliminating the requirement for a transitional height plane where multifamily structures abut single-family. Um, the reasoning for that was that there was no place um, currently that single-family uses abutted. Um, and two was uh, to define the word abutting. Um, the minutes of the CRA meeting have been uploaded to the Agenda Star program on your computers and a map of the surrounding land uses is displayed and in the Agenda Star program as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of staff? Which item in the star? Which item in star? That labeled okay. and then it doesn't look like they are in the star. I thought they were, but uh, wasn't that place in the star? The map. It, it's if it's not in the star, then it's in your agenda packet. Um, okay. Uh, let me look to see what page. The minutes are in the star, so and then the, is this the map you're looking for? Uh, it's that one showed up there. 121? Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. Oh, that's what you were showing on the.
Any questions? If, yes, Mr. Richards. I recall, it, I think, is this the, when council discussed this, they discussed the height going down in certain transitional. transitional. Yeah. So it's not 10 stories across the board. It's transitional height. Right, so the CRA recommended that the transitional height be removed, the, that requirement be removed um, based on an analysis of the surrounding land uses that showed that there were no existing uh, single family land uses. Um, there is one uh, single family residence, but apparently it's used for an office. So there's m no transitional height in this area? Because that's been removed by CRA. Well, only for the multifamily. Okay. And west of US 1. Okay. Member uh, Noel Copeland. On this map, which does this apply to this entire area or some portion of this area? It applies to this, I believe it applies to that entire shaded area that you see there with the colors. All the colors. Everything east of Florida East Coast Railway and north of Garden. So the, the green zone. stripes, the purple and the yellow. <laughs> that is the uptown district. Right. And right. You'll it see doesn't apply to the blue and the green on the other side. Correct. Okay. Right. You'll see the map of the uptown district and the other districts on page 117 of your packet. Any more questions of staff? This does not apply to the marina side of the uptown district, just this piece? Right. It would apply to uh, west of US-1. <coughs> So it's west of US-1 and north of Garden, correct? Yes. Just that. East of Garden. Correct. <laughs> 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 that <laughs> okay, any other questions? If not, uh, well, I think we have a card or two on this item. <laughs> Woody Rice. Uh, Woody Rice, 505 Indian River Avenue, Titusville. Um, first, uh, the district is Garden Street North, west of US-1, east of the railroad track, up to the, the bridge that goes over the railroad track. So it's a pretty isolated area on the west side. Um, how I got here was that we were working on a developer's agreement to sort of achieve achieve this. and. Uh, staff deemed that it was more appropriate to do an ordinance change for the height than to do that through a developer's agreement. And, and when we agreed, all right, let, we'll go, let's do that path. I recalled when I was back here looking at density probably seven, eight months ago, a lot of the discussion was I'm concerned about height on the east side within that district. So I talked to the planning director. I said, you know, we, we need to isolate this to the west side of, of US-1 because that was sort of the wishes of PNZ and, and a lot of the discussion that we had at that time. Um, so uh, staff agreed, and, and that's how we sort of got with, with, with the west. We have been um, to city council for advisability. We went to the CRA. They made some changes to it. Uh, they kept the west uh, uh, parameters in there. And... We're, without this, really, the project doesn't move forward. Okay, economically, it's 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 a win-win for our downtown. We would hope that each one of you all would support it. And um, unfortunately, the developers' agreement wouldn't come in front of you. But uh, we're not pursuing that at this time because the height is being addressed here through an ordinance change. But if you have any questions about the site or anything, um, here happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Rice? 
Okay, next. Tony Schifolo. Tony Schifolo, 715 Tropic Street, one of the 12 locally designated historic structures in Titusville. According to the city ordinances, the downtown mixed-use zoning district was established, and I quote, to promote the health, safety, social, and economic welfare of, of the residents of the city by increasing the city's tax base and promoting the long-term economic growth and vitality of the downtown area. This district enables the city to encourage public and private development compatible with the character of the downtown area and in conformance with the community redevelopment plan. It further states that this district can, and I quote, expand employment and living opportunities protect historic resources, promote new investment, protect the natural beauty and public spaces that make Titusville special and encourage public use of the waterfront. It concludes that the intention is preserving the unique character and historic fabric of the downtown end of quote, while providing a diverse, economically vibrant area for business, living, and entertainment. I visited the area under consideration, and while it seems forlorn, forsaken, and forgotten, it is adjacent to a residential neighborhood. It is within walking distance of the historic downtown area, and it's next to a nexus of recreation options along US-1 for tourists and residents. The Titusville Marina and Marina Park, Sandpoint Park, the Max Brewer Bridge and Causeway to Parish Park, and the National Seashore. Due to its proximity to the historic downtown, the development of this area should be harmonious, and in scale with the existing surroundings, all of which are no more than two stories tall, with the exception of the monstrous and obtrusive high-rise condos um, on the south side of the causeway. On nextdoor.com newsfeed for North Titusville, many citizens have expressed concern and dismay at the rampant, seemingly unchecked development across town. And several dozen of these people have written specific disagreement with the proposal to raise the height of buildings from five stories to 10. In fact, many disagree with the building of structures higher than two stories anywhere along the river, especially the riverfront properties. I share these sentiments and stand before you to request you consider not changing the height ordinance in the DMU and any districts east of the railroad track to the river in order to preserve and maintain the uniqueness and the quaintness of Titusville, affording access to the river both physically and visually for our citizens and visitors. Now, after I finally got to read the entire packet and the scope of this issue, I realize you're actually considering achieving internal consistency within um, the height ordinance. And I hope you will do so by limiting the height to five stories. I think it would be a mistake, and, and even though it might not be as economically physical, um, feasible to have a really tall structure. I think the thing that people like about, from all the reading I've been doing on this um, with citizens and um, people that are giving feedback on this issue, they like the fact that we're not like Miami Beach or um, Daytona Beach, for instance, with all these high-rise structures, especially along um, the riverfront. Thank you for hearing me. Okay, any questions by the commission? Okay. Any other cards on this item? Stan Johnston. Mr. Johnston. Uh, Stan Johnston, 860 Poinsett Avenue. Uh, I spoke with the CR agency very much against this, and uh, I had no comments at all. Uh, 
and uh, I mentioned it about creating a little Miami. I, I mentioned about what the Mrs. Schiff, Schiff. okay, Schifflow, uh, uh mentioned, and, and that is that uh, when we came to Titusville in 1970, it was bragged about. This is a low-rise community, very rare low-rise community. So uh, when, you, when you go to higher buildings, what you do is uh, you take away from that character which the city was bragging about. Uh, this was a, a unique character. In fact, is it's not only it's even more unique than you think. I was driving down from West Virginia. I heard on the radio. It said, "Do you know what the city is that has the highest per capita income in the United States? Titusville. Anybody heard of that city?" And I said, "Wow." So, and, and also, uh, it was known for the longest pier and and. Uh, uh, the uh, sea trout and all uh, other things. So now we have this also low rise, we're losing it. And I want you to know is that the agenda packet you have is different than the CRA packet you had. I'm serious. In the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, agenda packet that the CRA had is they had a table. Um, it was a height overlay boundary without a legend, and there was uh, different colors but no legend, and to me it, it something that seemed like it would have been nice if it was corrected, and if, if you had it. That's one of the things. Another thing is a very important uh, that, that was, that's been excluded from your packet. It shows the angles and so forth that are going to be used to limit the, the, uh, uh, the height of the building, like 45 degree angles from such and such and so forth. It's not in your packet. I don't know why I was excluded. It was important to CRA, but it's not important to you. I think it is important. So, so you've got even a different packet. Now, also, uh, when I spoke to the uh, CRA, I said, uh, here's what I said. I said, my goodness, let me quote it for you. It says, uh, page four of six of that <coughs> document says, 10 stories of Mackman Height for blank, 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 there, as approved by city council with a recommendation from the DCRA from the DCRA. Well, the DCRA makes decisions. Who is the DCRA? We know who the CRA is. So there's no correction to that. I mean, they just, just, uh, just, just completely ignore it. And, and it's passed on in this, in this, in, in your own, uh, uh, packet. So, uh, it's, it's, you know, they just, just go ahead and do what they want to do. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this is that, is that, uh, uh, DCRA, there is no agency DCRA. Maybe we'll have, make another agency. Uh, I got another comment here. Oh, uh, I, and I've commented about uh, this is creating another uh, a little, a little Miami. It's what it looks like we're doing. So that's it. And I, I'm also, I want you to be cautious of what you, of, of listening to what uh, Mr. Rice says. I've known him to be and can, can, uh, uh, make some dishonest statements in front of me, Mr. my wife. Uh, Mr. John, that has nothing to do with this issue. Absolutely does. He's, he's uh, representing, he has a fiduciary. As, as chairman, I'm ruling it has nothing to do with the issue. Do you have anything else you would like to add with regard to the issue? Well, I think it does. You don't want me to, you don't want me to tell, in other words, about someone who is very dishonest to our city manager? to me and my wife and so forth like that. We're who made some really strange We're decisions. focused upon this agenda item and I'd like to stick with the item. I think this has to do with That's my end. responsibility as chairperson. Yeah. Okay, all right. So uh, uh, maybe you can see behind me is that I have several yes. things and that shows the, the, what's going on in this city that, that is that uh, uh, I'm certainly shown with complete disrespect in many forms and prejudice and bias. And that's very true. Okay. I'm sorry, it's true. Okay. Do you have something to add concerning this particular item? Well, I don't think we should. I don't think we should. We should go to ten stories, even five right. stories. Thank you, sir. It's, Thank you. Well, maybe there's some questions. Any questions? Any questions, okay. Mr. Johnson? Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Commission. Any questions of staff?
Any uh, comments uh, by uh, the commission members? <coughs> Mr. Bobby. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so I was torn on this one a little bit. Um, I understand the importance of economic growth in our community, and I know that you know they're talking about bringing a convention center, entertainment facilities, uh, things that could possibly bring an economic improvement to our area, especially in the downtown area. But at the same time, on a, a as the the lady said earlier, it doesn't match our our current landscape and I know for a fact that most uh, citizens of the city do not want to see anything over five stories and I, I feel very sure that that's the majority of the feeling within the city residents um, aesthetically I mean I'm sure it would be a very nice building but just wouldn't match what what else we have there uh, I know that area has been abandoned for quite some time but I know like the Titus Landing area, nothing's over two stories there. And that's a beautiful area. We could do the same thing there. If, if there was a convention or a mall or even a hotel, you can have lower story hotels over, look at the Radisson in, in Port Canaveral. It's a beautiful property. It's not over two stories. We could do that here. And it would achieve the same thing. They just have to redraw it a little bit. And so my opinion is to vote no on this. If anyone else has a discussion, then yes, I'd like to make a motion to vote no on this. Okay. Uh, before that, Commissioner Taylor. This, this, uh, she, she had her button pushed. <laughs> um, you know, I've been I've been in this community for thirty years myself, and I think the fact that you know you've got the downtown area that's very um, receptive to a, a nice town look, but I look at this uptown portion as an area that's outside of the quaint Titusville city. And I think with the growth that we're seeing at the Space Center and the people that are coming in, it's almost a necessity to me to, to develop this, this piece of property. And I'm actually for this particular item. Okay, Commissioner Spardell. Um, I still don't see the characteristic of blending into the existing property. Ten stories is excessive and reminds me of the canyon kind of look of Satellite Beach, especially on the waterfront. And I know you're saying only east of the west of the railroad. Is that what you're saying? Okay. East of the railroad. Yeah. I just, I can't see it at all. I have a concern for the preservation of this neighborhood. Okay. Anyone else have any uh, comment? Yes. Go ahead. There was a conversation about two-story. I just want to be clear that the current rule is five-story. So we're not talking about lowering it. We're just yeah. saying we're not... Those that are talking about lower are not talking about lowering, right? You're just saying you don't want to go to 10. Correct. I was just okay. using the right as an sure, example of, of growing out instead of up. Yep. yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Richardson. Yes. Um, the question of the DCRA is located on page 111. What exactly does DCRA stand for? We know what CRA stands for. The D stands for downtown. Um, it, it's just a holdover in the code um, from a time when there were two CRAs and the other CRA was eliminated and it just hasn't been amended to just reflect the CRA language. <laughs> DC just stands, as Gabriel's mentioned, is downtown. Uh, so it's just another name for the same CRA that we currently have existence right now. Downtown CRA. Uh, downtown's redo, downtown um, redevelopment agency or area. So it, it's really the same thing. And okay. let me inquire from staff, is, is there any additions, amendments? This is the latest version that you are recommending. Is that correct? 
And did, did this include anything do, uh, with regard to the CRA's recommendation? It does include the CRA's Their recommendation. recommendation in there. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Uh, hearing no one else, uh, my comment primarily is um, if the city is going to allow additional height, uh, I would much prefer that it be in a centralized, probably downtown location, rather than halter skelter up and down the river's edge as the current uh, pattern exists. And um, uh, I, I personally uh, am very familiar with this particular property or properties. I would hope uh, this could be a stimulus to help the downtown and the downtown in general because Titusville downtown does need assistance, <laughs> particularly when you go to so many other downtowns uh, around us. So uh, with that comment, uh, Mr. Bowie. Uh, I, I, just wanna... I just wanna reiterate, we're a small town we and I, I like that. That's why I live here. Um, I know there's many retirees, there's many young families that, that feel the same way. And we established a five-story law a rule ordinance. I think we need to stick with it and just, you know, not try to grow to be a, a downtown Orlando or, or anything else like that. We have a small town feel. I think we need to stick with it. I am, I think five stories is even at some point a little high considering the surrounding areas, but I'm not saying, you know, we can't grow, but uh, again, it's just, I'm firmly against this. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, that we also have to understand if we're going to go up to 10 stories, that that includes additional um, parking facilities and it includes obviously additional people. I mean, right now the downtown area is pretty well stretched for parking and for convenience. Um, and I, I think it's a, I think we can, we can accomplish what we want to accomplish without going, without going up. And I think if we start doing that, then we're going to, um, I think open a floodgate where we're going to have lots of buildings that are going to be of that height and then it'll probably incrementally get pe you know people want to have larger buildings there's other places around Titusville where those buildings can be done but I think in this particular area that the five foot the five uh, story height regulation is is acceptable okay Commissioner Taylor is the this is confined to this one particular area, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this is the one particular area, I, and I still think where this is located, providing good parking, we don't have enough parking at all in Titusville. I just think this would be a good facility for that. Mr. Parrish. <laughs> Chairman, I just want to mention that on page 111 of your packet, you'll see at the second page of the ordinance. And it says there at the top of the page, typical building height, maximum of five stories with a few shorter buildings and up to 10 stories for what I'm gonna read the existing language, convention, hotel, entertainment, facilities, and or transit oriented development as approved by the city council <coughs> with a recommendation from the CRA or the, or the downtown CRA. So what that's saying is that there are certain areas where we think that a 10 story building would be appropriate with uh, with approval by city council. So I'm not sure what the process of that would be, if it's a separate ordinance or some kind of special development agreement or some kind of development order. I'm not sure what that would be. What we're throwing in here is that uh, from a planning perspective, we didn't see the difference between allowing a 10-story structure with a use that includes only convention, hotel, and ent entertainment facilities versus a multifamily structure, whether that's apartments or condos. So from a planning perspective, we didn't see the difference. 
So right now our code does allow some provision that if someone wanted to come in with a convention center with a hotel attached to it, that, that would, according to the code, is, would be more supportable right now to be allowed. So I just want to point that out to you. So, can we change that? You, you as a commission can make any recommendations to the council. I just want to okay. out to you that that's the current language in the code. Um, when from our perspective, we didn't, didn't see the difference with the different uses. If a height is allowed, we thought the downtown was the most appropriate place. Okay. And it looked like the uptown subdistrict, the way it's written, was designed and written for this kind of more intense use, including convention centers and hotels. So I think the applicant did mention at one point that they, you know, they spoke with us about potentially including a hotel as part of their concept. I'm not <laughs> sure if that's still the case, but that we didn't have any objection to that. So what I'm looking at is, you know, if we go to 95 and Highway 50, we've got one, two, three, four, five properties, hotel properties, just west of 95. Not one of them's over five stories. Why do we need that right by the river? by the river. This particular area here is actually west of US-1 and the railroad, and east of the railroad, so it's pretty... Right, but, but what I'm saying is you've got five properties that have set to present that, you know, these are all major chain hotels. They don't see the need to go over five stories. Our whole idea is to protect the, the river view, and that's the area that they can actually build up to if they include a convention center. To me, I think that needs to be changed a little bit, in, in my personal opinion, to prevent someone from coming in and saying, oh, well, you know, we can't build this 10-story property, but if we put convention center in the lobby, we can do it. So I, I think that's something that my fellow commissioners, we need to look at as well. Um, we can grow out. We don't have to grow up. And, and that is a large area. That's a large property that, that could easily be developed outward like a Titus Landing type atmosphere that could easily with five stories, you know, accommodate a hotel, uh, still a convention center and everything with a five-story limit as set in place by our predecessors. Okay, Commissioner Copeland. Um, do you know what the current vacancy rate is? How many empty units are on the condos on the river right there at the Max Brewer Bridge. How many of those units are empty? No, ma'am. We do not know that. I'm not sure how I'll be able to find that information for you as well. Um, I can certainly ask. If I, mean, there's someone could... I, think, I think in general you're going to have a higher vacancy rate on condos than you are maybe in a hotel because a hotel has a vested interest to fill those rooms up, whereas you could have long-term vacancy, shuttered windows... You know, I mean, we already see that. We already see hurricane shutters on the on windows in those units eight plus, you know, eight to twelve months per year in some of those cases. And so, while I understand the desire, you know, I, I what I, I would support the current five story because I think there is, you know, that gives the opportunity to have some parking on the low levels, then some retail, then some, you know, then some residential above have a multi use building, but to go to ten. When you have, I believe there's a fairly high percentage of vacant units literally across the street. I don't see the need to build that many more units okay. that would also potentially sit vacant. Okay. Well, I, I just want to respond that the applicant also, or the the applicant of the, of the development order that was withdrawn, also suggested that the property would be developed with an apartment complex. Right. So with a hotel. So it doesn't necessarily have to be. No, I understand. So from I'm from our saying, perspective, we didn't see the difference. Yeah. However, um, I don't know if you would want to recommend something more restrictive. If you, some, it sounds like some members are want to keep it at five, mem five uh, stories. Some members are okay with ten. I don't know if you can work it out with a recommendation to maybe come to a, an in between number, whatever that might be. I'm just throwing that out to the commission to consider. So. I think it's a slippery slope, and I think in the past we've said, you know, we have these rules, and then people come in and we give them we give them variances to it, you know, and like why have the rule if everybody that comes you're going to go go up more. So if we go to seven, then somebody's going to come in with ten and want that variance. So, you know, I I personally don't want to see it go any higher than the current five in this location, this close to the river. Commissioner Spardell. I 
will voice again the look of Satellite Beach and the canyon approach to development. And if when you're talking about occupancy rate, um, you're looking at a very lovely designed mall, which certainly is not at 100% capacity by a long shot. And a vacant one about half a mile Thank south. Thank you. Thank you. Don't, don't hurt what you got. Any additional questions or uh, comments by the commission? We'll go back to you, Mr. Bobby. Do you want to make a motion? Yes, yes, sir. I, I was, I'm <laughs> We're finally button back. happy all over here. So, <laughs> I would like to make two motions. The first motion would be that we vote no on this ordinance um, or this change to the ordinance. Uh, the second motion would be for us to review the current standing where hotels or conventions could come in and actually raise that height. And I think we need to revisit that and prevent that from happening. Okay. We, we'll, we'll need to have those in separate motions. So okay. your first for motion is to deny the ordinance. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Second. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion on the, uh, the motion? Uh, we have a roll call. Member Taylor? No. Member Noel Copeland? Yes. Secretary Spido? Yes. yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Idison? Yes. Vice Chairman Bobbitt? Yes. Chairman Severs? No. You'd like to make your second motion? Okay. <laughs> they muted me. All right. The uh, second motion is I think we need to revisit the current uh, ordinances that state that a hotel or a convention center, or I'm sorry, you will. I'm sorry. Would you repeat that? Which one? The second. Okay. Yeah. So the second motion is that uh, I believe PNZ commissioners need to revisit the current ordinance that allows a hotel, convention center, or however else is worded currently, entertainment district, to allow them to come in and build over uh, up to 10 stories. I think we need to revisit that. And um, pretty much lock it in at five. Point of discussion. Do we have a second to the motion? I have a question. Okay. So question. Does the I thought you said that it allowed that with city council approval. Yeah, no, I just want to clarify what I've read in that page one eleven of your packet is not a blanket. Hundred uh, ten stories is allowed. What it says is typical building height, maximum five stories with a few shorter, up and up to 10 for convention, hotel, entertainment facilities, and or transit-oriented development. So to me, that reads like it actually probably has to be part of a transit-oriented development, which is another section of the code that talks about that. And that probably requires a, a separate type of approval. I don't know how to answer what okay. type of approval is. But what I, I would like to see, I'm sorry to, to interrupt. I think what you're getting at is a clarification on what that is and what potentially could be allowed. I, I would like to have it clarified to nothing over five stories. Okay. And, and that's how I would like to see it. Do, do we have a second to that motion? A second. Okay. Uh, do we have a second? Uh, oh. Okay. Discussion. Is this more appropriate? Turn your mic on. Is this more appropriate for the comprehensive plan? If I may, yes, no, maybe make the motion maker aware of um, the parameters for this particular board. The Planning and Zoning Commission doesn't have the ability to change the code. However, you do have the ability to make a motion to suggest City Council look at a particular section and that they provide the advisability to send something to staff to revise or have you all look at a particular section. But the motion would need to be amended to reflect that you're asking council to look at something. Okay. So I'd like to amend my motion to request for council to allow us to review pretty much how you worded it. Help you're me asking out here. Council for advisability to review the code section on the height of buildings in the downtown CRA. She said. <laughs> pretty much, you just copy and paste that. <laughs> All right. And can, uh, and can the I motion ask, has been clarified. Okay. Uh, any, any additional comments? I, I think it would be more appropriate to make this a part of the comprehensive plan. 
Yeah, you certainly will have that opportunity to do so when yeah. we get to the new comprehensive plan. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Isn't can... that the most appropriate vehicle to to do this kind of? Typically, these kind of things you want to keep in the land for regulations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, a comprehensive plan is more policy related. Okay. So okay. That's Thanks. my recommendation. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Commissioner Noel Copeland, I think you were next. No, I. You're, you're done. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any uh, further discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, let's have a roll call. Vice Chairman Bobbitt? Yes. Secretary Spidell? Yes. Member Noel Copeland? Yes. Member Idison? Yes. Member, uh, Member Taylor? No. Member Richardson? Yes. Chairman Sievers? Yes. Okay. Any other uh, action on that particular item? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next item on the agenda is City Council's <coughs> summary of action. Uh, staff. <laughs> So the summary of action from City Council, there's no action required. If you have any questions on those items, staff's here to answer them. If not, we can move on to the next item. We have a card on item 10B. On, uh, on item 10, which? B. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm focused on 10A at the moment. Uh, I did have a, uh, a question and I'm looking at, uh, we had recommended uh, with regard to the uh, ordinance uh, dealing with, I'm trying to see which one it was, uh, as far as the wetland survey, that that be included in the, uh, the development review procedure technical manual. What was the action of council on that? A council uh, moved to, or they approved that code. Are you talking about the five-year? Uh... No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what page are you on? Uh, I'm on uh, 126, right? and, 26, and also 128. There was a resolution amending the development review procedures, technical manual to uh, wetland survey. Uh, and staff provided a revised resolution. As you may recall, we recommended that the wetland survey include rezonings, uh, CUPs, and something else. Was our recommendation agreed to? I don't know. Did staff it, change your recommendation? <laughs> yes, I'm asking. So on page 127 of your packet, I believe is what you're looking at at the very beginning here, it says that on um, that item related to that wetland survey. Yes. Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed this ordinance on the 22nd of this year, recommended approval. Motion was to approve the recommendation that City Council consider amending the technical manual to include rezoning requests, planning development requests, and conditional use permits. Approved as recommended. So we made changes to that technical manual according to what I'm reading here. And that was reviewed by City Council, and they approved that recommendation by you. Well, could, could you check on that? Because most of the time, approved as recommended is what you recommended, not what we recommended. We can verify for you, and we'll okay, say that. Because yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. I can't tell. Okay. So we'll send that, that Thank you. final resolution to you. Okay. <coughs> okay. And can be, does anyone have any questions or comments upon that item? On the commission, we do have a card on that item. Okay, Mr. Johnson, uh, you're on 10B. Yes, 10B. There's an error. Uh, my name is Stan Johnson. Just a quick, quick comment. Is okay. that is that uh, says there was no uh, action taken on petitions and requests. Uh, I asked for. Uh, I'm asking directing to the mayor when I'm speaking. Petitions and requests. I said I don't have 
the report that you claim uh, uh, has a review of my uh, correspondence. I haven't got it. And he said he directed the uh, city attorney to uh, obtain that report. So that was an action that I was to receive the report. And that's important because I still haven't got the report. And I just sent you a letter today to uh, that you didn't get it, and I don't believe you got it, uh, dated today about this issue. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Next item, 10C, Sunshine Law and Public uh, Meeting Guidance. Attorney. <laughs> All right, commissioners, good evening. I'm here today to provide a refresher on something that I know you are, all are very familiar with. It is the Florida Sunshine Law. It is found at Florida Statute Section 286.011. And to kick this off, I'd like to look for a volunteer sitting up in the dais tonight. I'd like one of you all to, by show of a red light on your microphone, tell me that you'd like to tell me what the three components are of the Sunshine Law, those three elements that must be met. Can anybody do that? Can you give me just one of the three? You don't have to give me all three. I think I could do one. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so put your mic on. <laughs> one of them is that outside of the official meeting, you cannot discuss items that appear on the agenda. That is the most important component of the Sunshine Law. Thank you for remembering that and reminding your fellow commissioners. <laughs> okay, so I'll go through the other two because that's the last one that I normally hit. The first two we take care of here at a staff level. The minutes of all public meetings must be kept and we have a recording secretary at all of our meetings to make sure that every word that is spoken on the microphone is recorded. Not every single word, but the ones that are the most important, the things that talk about our official business that we need to keep record of in the minutes. Now, the minutes do not include every word because that's not necessary to get an idea of what happened, but the minutes need to show whoever's reading them a general idea of what happened so you can understand how a decision was achieved. The second component of the Sunshine Law is that all of our meetings must be open to the public, noticed. The city staff takes care of publishing that notice of our agenda, the topics that are scheduled to be discussed at the given meeting that you are here to conduct. So we take care of those first two components, but you have to take care of this third component, which is to monitor what you're speaking about and who you're speaking to as it relates to the official business that may come before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Because any topic that may come before you for a vote as a member of this commission is something that you're prohibited from talking about outside of this public meeting with your fellow commissioners. So that means that you can talk to other members of the community, the city council members, the TEC members, you can talk to other boards about your topics on this board, but you can't talk to one another right after the meeting is adjourned, adjourned or right before the meeting starts. When, when you're in this room, does it mean that we're, it's a public meeting? It has to be when the meeting has started and before the meeting has concluded, and it has to be something that everybody can hear. So any side conversation is something that I regularly have to remind board members not to do. You have to make sure that your microphone is on and that you're the only person who is authorized to speak by the chair so that the minutes can properly record who's speaking and who's saying what. I have to admit, sometimes it's difficult for me to acknowledge who the second is on this board because you all are so excited to get your motions passed. And that's a good thing, but I don't know how Lori does it because, <laughs> okay, so maybe she just figures it out by looking at you, but I, half the time I don't know. So maybe even a hand would help me just for whatever it's worth. It is great that you guys are all enthusiastic to participate, but try to keep those things in mind. Um, another component of the Sunshine Law that's separate and apart from those three elements that I've already covered is the public records law. Do any of you all have any questions about what that is and how it applies to you? Anything specific? Public records is, means that any record that talks about our official business is a public record and 
the city staff again keeps a good record of all of the agenda items so that we have them but in the event that someone ever asks for correspondence that you all participate in that is also subject to the public records law so any emails that you send just a friendly reminder if anyone from the public wanted a copy of that they could ask the city clerk for the public records that we have really as they relate to public uh, official business so keep that in mind as you send your electronic and written correspondence if you don't want something to be kept as a public record you can always pick up the phone the only way to avoid your communication not being a part of the public record law is if it's verbal only so just keep that in mind when you're writing your correspondence and asking your questions we are question, question. go ahead if uh, all uh, members of the Commission receive correspondence from someone uh, are we required to keep those, uh, particularly if the uh, city, the recording secretary, has the original or a copy? Are if we the city has an original, then you don't need to keep or okay. worry about okay. that. Okay. Are there any other questions that may have come up so far? Okay. Just one more. So just to clarify, we're all on a group email. We cannot hit reply all. There you go. But so we're all in a group email. We cannot reply all. That's correct. Okay. You can, but we would advise against it because that would open you up to be a potential conduit. You may not ask something that would be a direct violation of the Sunshine Law, but to avoid the likelihood of that happening, we advise against it. Okay. Um, The methods of communication that are covered are, again, the written correspondence, um, use of non-members as a liaison or a conduit. So that is when you may have conversation with one of us at, at city staff, you have the potential to ask questions about what some other members may have said, but I want to caution you against doing that because what a conduit is someone who may relay the thoughts or impressions of one person to another. So more likely you may have a conduit from a member of the public. So if you go and talk to one of the members of the tree team, for example, on an issue related to trees, and they start talking to you about one of your fellow commissioners. You have to stop them. It's your duty as a commissioner to not allow someone in the public to be a conduit to share the thoughts of another person who they may have talked to. And so before that happens, you can stop them in their tracks. And the best way to correct a potential violation of the Sunshine Law is to come talk to me. So if you think that you may be on a gray area and you're not sure, just give me a call immediately and we'll set up a time to talk or we can talk it over on the phone, exact, exactly the ins and outs of what happened. And if I think that there's something that you should be concerned of, you can disclose that at a public meeting and let everyone know that there's this possible violation and that would neutralize the effect of having something said that you didn't intend to hear or have come across to you and to avoid any potential violation in the future, you want to disclose that as quickly as possible. <clears throat> the consequences of violating the Sunshine Law. Any person who is a member of a board or commission who knowingly violates the sun Sunshine Law is guilty of a misdemeanor of the second degree. You have to be knowingly violating it. So if you don't know and you correct it, then that, I, I don't think that would rise to that level. But there's, there's plenty of examples out there if you want to hear some horror stories. I don't want to go through anything too treacherous, but I could bring that back at another meeting if you want to hear some um, terrible examples of what happens to commissioners gone awry. I actually do have that stuff here, but I don't want to keep you all, all night. And what I plan to do with this board, since the city council has on their agenda the appointment of two more members. Two regular member positions are open due to the chairman leaving and another not renewing her term. So after the next council meeting, I'm going to have two new members to acquaint with this board and I'll come back probably every six months or so and provide additional information. If you have a particular topic or a question that you would like me to cover, I'd be happy to do that at a future meeting. So just feel free to send me an email if you think that there's something that would be helpful for the rest of the group. I appreciate your time here this evening, and I look forward to speaking to you guys again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is 10E, the uh, wedge We have prop. a card on 10C. Oh, we, we, have, we have a card on that? Okay. Sorry, sir. No, no, that's fine. Uh, Stan Johnson, 860 points at Avenue. Uh, on the Sunshine Law, uh, I heard her, her presentation at the her previous meeting, and uh, uh, the, the issue about the conduit was, in, was, con, was discussed. And uh, my understanding, as I've been told, is that is, is the way the city does its operations right now is that uh, the uh, uh, city manager, I've been told the city manager and the uh, attorney meets individually with each council member for the council before they uh, have a regular council meeting. So, I mean, there's an appearance right there is that the uh, city manager can be a conduit. Uh, and uh, that's that's a concern that I have, uh, and maybe they are, maybe they're not. Um, but uh, I say things, and, and I'm especially uh, 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 my conversation is terminated at council meetings, which leads me to suspect that hey, there is there that it's being sunshine law is being circumvented. I'm not saying violated; I'm saying circumvented. So uh, that's a concern. And I, I sent an email. To, I tried to do it to everybody on this board today, but I didn't get it to this fellow and these two young ladies. Uh, so I hope I didn't violate the Sunshine Law. Maybe I did. But I, uh, I, I sent it to also um, uh, city manager and, and uh, mayor and everybody else. So maybe I violated the Sunshine Law, but if I did, I'm sorry. So thank you. Okay, next item, the uh, wedge property. This, uh, we just provided information based on a request from Mr. Uh, Richardson at the last meeting related to the property that is currently known as the wedge property. Uh, there's a site plan there, um, and we just we looked at our records uh, related to the questions about a previous development that may have been may or may not have been supported by staff. So we just provided a history here, and if you have any questions about it, we'll try and answer them. Well, I think it's a pretty concise review, but there's several things missing, like for example. It was reported uh, in the Florida Today on April 22nd, 2016, that uh, Robin Fisher, Commissioner Fisher, had a meeting with staff in Wawa. And that is not. In, in fact, if you read that the report we were given, there's a three year gap. So that's water under the bridge right now. I'm concerned about this piece of property. Because if you look now, and I sat there for several minutes and looked at the traffic, to gain entrance into this site from Highway 50, once you immediately cross 405, <coughs> they've got a, a deceleration lane and a turn lane. We're asking for a lot of accidents at that intersection. And the property between I-95 and Moran North Ford okay. and between Target and Aldi's is a mess. And I think, um, I, I hate those roundabouts, but it would be, be much better used than what is planned. So you're referring to a plan that the traffic dot for that proposing. Okay. Uh, Cumberland Farms okay. and the tire store and the dentist's office on that location. So the site itself or the, or the plan that F dot is for. Well, I realize that F dot controls everything okay. regarding transportation, but uh, I think that's a recipe, uh, recipe for disaster. Okay. 
Okay. Anyone uh, else have any comments? Uh, I was concerned about the um, editorials and the letters to the editor in the paper and the amount of fill dirt that's gone into that property. Yeah. Me too. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm, I am not an engineer, but I've counted the trucks just sitting there at the light. I mean, it seems like an excessive amount of fill. It, it was used. obviously wet when they were ripping obviously. everything out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and it's, it's gaining, it's, it, people are talking about it in the public. Anyone else has any questions or comments? Uh, I myself did, did look at this. Uh, I did go on the website of St. John's Water Management District and saw the history. I appreciate staff providing the background information. I looked at the soil boring reports, the environmental reports, etc. Uh, like you, Mr. Richardson, I looked at this uh, approved grading and drainage plan and site plan, and it is it is what it is, but it's going to be a disaster as far as accidents, traffic flow, because you certainly can go west uh, if you're going uh, eastbound on State Road 50. You can turn into the site uh, right in front of all the traffic going uh, westbound yeah. on 50, and exactly the same way on South Street. And the conflicts between there and the entrance to uh, Lowe's is going to be exciting. <laughs> but I'm not sure the city has much to do about that. What was interest to me was um, uh, mitigation. And once again, um, this, uh, if you have money and you send it to um, a certain uh, Farmington uh, in uh, Volusia County, you can mitigate. And you can pay the money, and that does not uh, stay, that mitigated land does not stay within the mitigation of wetlands, does not stay in Titusville. I think a serious question in accordance with the current comprehensive plan as far as whether that's appropriate. But in any event, whether it is or isn't, uh, I see if we're reviewing the comprehensive plan, the 2040 plan, uh, we need to address that issue. I spoke recently at the Board of County Commissioners meeting because Bavard County for more than 20 years has not allowed uh, mitigation outside of Bavard County. You can't do like uh, this developer did, the developer of numerous other properties that I could list, pay some money, uh, get rid of our wetlands here in Titusville and buy some land in uh, Volusia County to offset the impact of that wetlands. I don't think that's personally right. Uh, I thought we had a philosophy of no net loss of wetlands, and we are having a continuing net loss of wetlands. So when we get to the comprehensive plan, I want to make sure we all are looking at that, uh, whether or not council agrees with that or not, I don't know. But it is a very important issue that will be is reoccurring as far as uh, uh, the loss of wetlands here in Titusville. So I, I see looking at this as a learning experience. It's, it's what we're doing, and do we want to continue doing that? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, continuing on with the agenda, I think. Uh, We have uh, staff reports. Anything from staff? Staff has no report. Anything from the uh, city attorney's office? I've said my piece. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll start on this end, uh, Commissioner Taylor. Will you have any comments or <laughs> issues or concerns? Chairman. You have petitions and requests from public presence. All right. 
I'm not going to overlook that. Mr. Johnston, would you like to come back up, sir? I lost my agenda. Thank you, sir. Did I hand this out before? I think I yes. I did? Yes. Okay. I'm not going to avoid repeating things, but uh, I'm bringing these because uh, this concerns the I have an all meeting. <laughs> Here's it. Yes, please. Stan Johnson, 860 points out Avenue. Um, I'll give this to you. But, uh, Lori in a minute. Um, I, and Mr. Bobbitt, uh, at one time uh, at a meeting, I don't know whether it was TEC or here, he said that uh, uh, he'd like to have an inf some information about what's going on, what I presented, uh, I believe it was the last time here, and that was that uh, uh, we don't, we have uh, uh, non-maintenance of uh, canals, floodways between, uh, that are west of I-95 and that are um, between between La Fox Lake Road and State Road 50, uh, this covers this map is a city's map. Uh, you see a division line. This this says uh, St. John's River system. This says Indian River system. So what I've sent to you is this is another thing I'll do. I'm repeating that, and that is that these uh, huge box culverts. Uh, the water is going through them is is very slow. It's not what it's designed for, and um, uh, I think that someone was going to report. I don't remember who it was was going to report to this committee, Mr. Whatever, Mr. Bob. Was it here? Uh, yes, it, it was. Okay. PNZ. So they were going to report on on that, and I, I guess nobody's doing it. Uh, so I wrote um, a um, a letter that I sent to you. And it's, uh, it's, it's going to be something you, you, you'll find distasteful uh, because it concerns. Its title of it is the non-existent report of review of my correspondence in your dishonesty, arrogance, fraud, and danger to the public. That has to do with this. In other words, this is going to city council, this letter, and copied to, to you guys and a lot of other people, even the Florida Board of Professional Engineers. It says, Dear City Manager, Mayor, and Council Members, to try to be clear, the two below emails concern your mischief and misconduct. That is that is that that error I told, I told you about? In other words, city uh, attorney does not give me the report because he doesn't have it. It doesn't exist. This report, city manager claims about 2012 through 2019, it doesn't exist. So this fraud has been going on for over, over a year now. And uh, the uh, as, as far as I can see, there's a council and uh, our city manager are all promoting this 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 uh, this fraud so this is this should be of special importance to you so I'll try to read this um, uh, in your, is your about your permission to promotion the fraud regarding the report of the review of my correspondence to city from 2012 to 2019 that allegedly city paid about 70,000 for the details of this report and fraud are recorded and described verbatim in RB 8506 page 1374 I would like I would like you to listen to this because this is important. Well, we, we need to find out whether we have a motion to grant additional time. Do we have a motion for granting additional time? Hearing none. Obviously, you don't want to hear it. Well, you guys are are. Uh, 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 it's a shame. Thank you, sir. I, I consider this. Uh, you should be. You should be listening to what's going on. Uh, we we're ba back at uh, reports. I have no report. No report, Mr. Bobby. No report. 
a report. No report, sir. <laughs> okay. No report. Well, it comes to me. I have two items. items. I have a couple items, too. <laughs> <laughs> that I'd like to bring up. I had a conversation with Brad last week that was, I think, real productive, where I expressed to him, among other things, that we've canceled three out of the last five meetings. And at least we should, we should not cancel those meetings. Uh, we should have time to uh, discuss the 2040 plan and workshop. Uh, almost a majority of this commission has been appointed in the last six months. So we need to bring you all up to date on the 2040 plan and the staff um, was missing a couple of staff members at the time. So we had uh, about 20 pages of comments that they were to incorporate from uh, Chairman Sievers or past Chairman Williams and me. Um, so we should, we should avoid canceling any meetings and instead uh, make those kind of workshops to bring everything up to date. The second thing I would say is uh, Sean Williams was the chairman of this commission for, I guess, well, not necessarily chairman, but he's been on the commission for 20 years. And I think he deserves more than a nice letter. Yes. So I know I get in trouble with this all the time from Chelsea and the city attorney. I'd like to suggest that uh, we have a a dinner or a luncheon, nothing particularly special about it, but just a gathering that we invite him and show how much we appreciate his service um, sometime in the next month. <laughs> and we'll be careful not to violate the sunshine law. That's the only thing we're that I ask have you to, to be say there is that as we well can't as the staff. talk about official business at this meal. We'll talk about past business. <laughs> but uh, I'd just like to know if y'all are interested in that. Yes. So I will take it upon me to contact <clears throat> former Chair Chairman Williams and see if we can work something out and report it at the next meeting. I, I, I may have more of a problem than the, uh, the attorney <laughs> may have because uh, fundamentally, uh, the public has to be, if we're going to have a meeting, not a meeting, even though uh, you're saying it's not a meeting, the public probably should be uh, allowed and it has to somewhat be at a public place because I, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Richardson, but uh, it just as an abundance of caution, I I have a it would certain it would certainly be in a public restaurant. I yeah. think that's the example that he's and would done post before. a notice. It would be posted. And okay. as as what we did for um, Mike Cunningham, for example, and for Code Board Attorney. Yeah. Richard. Okay. As long as you do all those things. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to wear a tie at a luncheon. <laughs> <laughs> and just to make sure, she's not had a baby yet, right? Well, okay. <laughs> Is that all, Mr. Richards? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess two items. Uh, I contacted Mr. Parrish and, uh, about the low impact development, and there was a presentation. A copy of that was forwarded to, to all of you. Uh, he provided me with examples in other jurisdictions and, and the ordinances. I strongly, strongly, strongly believe that is a very viable option, particularly within the area of critical concern and <laughs> other areas, and uh, would respectfully suggest that we, at some meeting soon, start discussing that because I see it as a being a very positive thing, beneficial uh, to the city. I thought that city council, I, I went to the city council meeting to hear the presentation and I thought it was of great value. Uh, the other uh, tree ordinance, that the, which apparently is before uh, the um, TEC, 
Uh, I, I respectfully suggest that we not wait until TEC is done with it and then be under the gun to, uh, to uh, act upon it. Uh, a lot of members here may have their own ideas that may be consistent or may not be <coughs> consistent with what TEC, but I would respectfully suggest that we uh, think, think about that and uh, get, get started with reviewing that ordinance as well. I don't know how the rest of you think about it, but I would suggest we uh, I actually, review these two items. I might have a question on that. Uh, for my day job, I'm actually being approached to be a co-signer of the letter to endorse the low-impact development. Would that eliminate me from anything on this panel? Or? I, don't, I don't see why it would. Okay. Okay. What well, can they do? Comment? Yeah, he needs to comment. He's not said anything all night. <laughs> yes, Mr. Moyer. Thank you. Yes, that was. Well, um, I guess yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other business to come? <coughs> Meeting's adjourned then. <laughs>